What's happening? What's happening? Bada bing. How are you? <laughs> Here we go. Excited about today's show. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live worldwide. What's going on out there? Yeah. Yes, Paul. Good to see everybody. I'm excited to see everybody today. It's going to be a great show. Got a good feeling about this today. It is. It is Sunday shout out day. Lest, lest we forget what's happening. What's up, Rue? What's going on in Sweden, man? Holding it down. Just saw Anthrax. Oh, just saw Anthrax last Thursday. All right. All right. Juski, what's happening, brother? My Polish brother. All right, good. It's all good. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Great show today. Um, I missed you. I'm happy to see you. And I'm grateful. I'm like Mr. Rogers. Like, yo, I'm grateful that we have this time together. <laughs> also grateful for my sponsors, for our sponsors. New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, and the Texas Silver Rush is a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces, as well as styles them for stage, album covers, promo, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers, Greg Rollet, Ringo Starr, and of course, the mighty Agnostic Front. During this current pandemic, all information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram page, and of course, www. The Texas Silver Rush.com. Also, come on now, located in Corpus Christi, Texas. Chacho's Tacos opened their doors in 2001, home of the almighty Chacho's Taco. They cook up an incredible home style Tex Mex food, and this month they're celebrating their 20th anniversary. They've been supporting underground music since the beginning, in their own words, we ain't stopping anytime soon. Touring bands that play Corpus Christi swung, swing by and get a home cooked meal at Chacho's Tacos. We got you. The underground scene will never die. Please follow us on Facebook or on Instagram. That said, that's it. Everybody okay? So we'll play the song later on again. What's going on in Norway? What's happening in upstate New York, Rick? Come on now. Gary in Miami. All right, the gang's all here. Whoa, we even got girls. Meredith, what's happening? Good. We need more girls tuning in on this show. Tired of you knuckleheads. Bunch of, it's, like a, it's like a knucklehead fest here. There you go. Shout out to Cox Spar for an awesome gig in Glasgow last night. All right. Good, good. All right, here we go. How about we bring on this dude, the hardcore, the hardcore shutter bug. Hello. <laughs> Hello, ball. <laughs> Hello, ball. Address Hello. the ball. <laughs> Address the ball. I'm Hello, je ball. I'm jealous. I'd love to see Cox Spar again right now. Bro. Let's just talk about the honeymooners. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, <Yeah. laughs> bro. But those are Corey Apple. That's classic. That's the that's the great that's a great episode. That one that one and when they learned they teach him how to do the um was it the rumbo or the mambo or something like that? They teach him the mambo and he, she's getting the lessons from the from 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 the Spanish dude. <laughs> it's that's you know classic. On, classic. All right. Now, this photo, uh, uh, the photo of the day here, I just want to tell everybody that, all right, here we go. Right, let's just do photo. Photo of the day, wrong answers only, please. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, photo of the day. Boom. Wrong answers only, please. Let's see what we got here. Chef of the future. Hey, chef of the future. This is Corey Apple. There we go. <laughs> All right. Yep. Here we go. Is it Spinal Tap? Now, is it Man of War? Is it Venom? Is it What's Up, Guys? <laughs> is it Judas Priest? Is it Slaughter? All right. Is it... Is it Striper? Striper's ah. gonna come in. Striper's gonna come into play on this show. All right, you you, you listen. You want to pull the Striper card? You want to pull the Striper card? 
Well, here it is. What's up with that shirt, bro? What's up, bro? <laughs> What's up? <laughs> Ah! I bought all this metal shit at the flea market. I ain't going to get into it today, but right. it's got the interview with Anthrax in it and this, and Stripers on the cover, and I bought the shirt somewhere else. It's all connected, people. Well, you're just getting your – your Striper game is strong today, Rap Bones. Yeah, That's it. Soldiers on the command. Don't front. Is it, is, it liege, is it Liege Lord? Is it Leeway? Is it Eddie and the Stripers? <laughs> is it Quiet Riot? Is it the gluten-free motherfuckers? No one's ever seen them. <laughs> All right. You sent me another one, right? I think I did. I think I did. I think I did. I think I did. I thought I did. All right. Well, this dude, this dude comes into play on today's show because he's a big influence. He it was a big influence uh, on our guest. Um, having I know that. I just read his book. So, yep. Oh, is that right? Chris Hoffman says, I saw Striper at Nassau Community College and caught a Bible. <laughs> right in the eye. Some, pe <laughs> some people catch a beating. I caught a Bible. And he, Jesus. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> what the hell was that? <laughs> That's hysterical. God. All right. Wow. Is it Bilbo Baggins? I always right. felt Steve Harris had a Hobbit kind of vibe. He's very short. You know? <laughs> All right, let, let, let's, 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 let's get right to it. Um, is it Steve? Is it Steve Harris? Is it Steve Harris? Is it the man yeah. Steve Harris? Is it Bilbo <laughs> Baggins? Is it Steve Harris? Is it Steve is a bass legend? Yes, yes, yes. to all those except for Bilbo. Is it? Is it <laughs> Steve Harris is my bass hero and I've been playing for 32 years myself? Is it Willie Nelson? Good one. I came out of nowhere. Is it Kira Roslair? Is that how you pronounce that? Ro Ros Rosler, I think, right? Rosler. Kira? All right, what is this, bro? That is, of course, Steve Harris. You know, the fact that it's Iron Maiden and Drew breaking your cardinal rule, Steve Harris is wearing an Iron Maiden shirt. He, uh, they've always gotten away with it, you know? Yeah, no, Iron Maiden can wear their own stuff. That's right, right. that's it right. It doesn't seem they, to come they off They played a tour in Europe with Biohazard, and they saw doing it, and they were like, <laughs> we'll do that too. That's right. it. They this was a uh, the Hammerstein Ballroom when Bruce returned to the band uh, Brave New World, and it was uh, Iron Maiden and Clutch, which was a great, great double bill. And uh, this was the first time back in New York. Yeah, when when Bruce Dickinson rejoined the band. There he is. There he is. The Pirates they, of Penzance. They uh, to this day, these guys just they're big. They're probably bigger now than they ever were. This this was the first tour after I saw them. The only time I ever saw Iron Maiden with Blaze oh, Bailey. Yes, so... oh, sorry for you. Yeah, That's the one and only time I ever saw Iron Maiden at the Academy, and it was like pretty empty with Blaze Bailey. The uh, yeah, the last show I saw was at the Gramercy, and it was Steve Harris and British Lion. That was before the COVID hit. That was the ah. last live show I went to. Oh, right on, British Lion. Yeah, that record is, that's that's his side thing. That doesn't really speak to me. Is that but, his uh, kids' band or something? Or is that his no, band? no, his his son has a band. Uh they opened up for the Raven Maiden on the last tour. Right? Raisin? A, um, I forget the name of the band. Uh Raisin? Raisin. Raisin. The um <laughs> his 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 daughter We're Raisin. <laughs> his in fact, Steve's daughter had a band uh years ago, Lauren Harris. And that's where Judas Priest got their guitar player from, Richie Faulkner. Ah. Okay. So it all comes around, you know? What comes around goes around. Yeah, this was uh this was a great show for me. And I, you know, like I got this is some of my favorite shots of them uh from this particular show. A, I love who that. Made, I love the Hammerstein. Made a film, who made a film on Alistair Crowley called Crowley? Steve Harris? Uh, who made a... Not that I know of. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Don't. All right. Go on. But uh, no, I I just. Uh, What's I, the guitar was... player's name next to him? Is that Adrian? No, that's Dave, Dave Murray. Murray. Dave Murray. Okay. Yep. You know, you know my. Uh, admittingly, my Iron Maiden game is not that strong. We'll have to bring you to a Maiden oh, show Bruce when they Dickinson. come around. Bruce Dickinson did an Alistair Crowley movie. Yes. Okay. I, I right. think the people need to demand an Iron Maiden Patreon show. 
They got to ask for it. We'll do it. All right. We could really cover it all. I don't think all you'll right. need to twist mine and wrap Owen's arms on no that way. one too much. I'll fall into it. You know, I'm warming up to Iron Maiden after all these years. That's it. Hey, you know, you know what? Just for, for people out there, just so they know, sometimes we actually we actually all hang out together, right? Hey, there it is. Yeah. Yep. Even even Sid. <laughs> even Sid was Sid in on this bike. Right? We look, we're, we look like we're channeling the Beastie Boys here. Even Sid, huh, Sid? Yeah, even me. Even I came out. <laughs> it was good yeah. to see you guys, man. And once in a cool. while, so once in a while, we actually people. It's it's, it's interesting, and, and and I'm sure, I'm sure, like our, our our guests can relate. Although some of this is actually true for a while in his life. People think we all live together like the Brady Bunch or something. <laughs> like we all like, hey, hey, like, hey, rap bones. Like, <laughs> hey, you know, here's a story of a bunch of hardcore dudes <laughs> who were hanging in New York City. Right? It's funny when That's sometimes cool. when we have like six guests on, we do the whole Brady Bunch thing on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hey, listen, let's get our guest on. Let's 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 get this horse out and run it around the track, huh? Okay. Release the house. Yeah. Excited right. for today's show, man. Anthrax since fistful of metal, baby. I know you love I've them. All you, all you Jersey, yeah. all you Jersey metal, all you old school Jersey metal heads, man. You know? All right, Rad. I'll see you later. All right, all right. Sid, don't fall asleep on me. I'll see you in a bit. All right, bro. I'll, I'll see you soon. <laughs> There you go. All right, here we go. Come on now. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Want to mention um, a couple of shows coming up. Next four shows. Don't be shy. Let's let it fly. Here we go. Next four shows. What do you know? Uh, Sunday, October 24th, a week from today, Richie Crutch Mancuso from Wisdom in Chains, uh, Z9, and Box Cutter coming on the show. Come on now. Um, then Sunday, October 31st, Halloween. Eddie Sutton from Leeway is coming on the show. Uh, this should be interesting. Eddie hasn't been doing a lot of stuff publicly. Um, so he's, he's coming out. He's going to talk to us. Wednesday, November 3rd, Adam and the Metal Hawks. It is the first in our side trip series where we're going to go out and do some other things. Some other things. We just... I'm going to throw myself out of this window if I have to keep talking hardcore every show. Uh, Wednesday, November 10th, back to the hardcore grind with Andrew Klein of Strife. So it's all going, it's all going down, my friends. Want to mention another show that I'm announcing it for the first time. Uh, this, one, this one strikes very close to my heart. Uh, he was a dear friend. Uh, he put me on back in the day. On Wednesday, October 27th, we're doing a Scott Koenig tribute show. We're going to have Bobby Hamble and Danny Shuler from Biohazard. We're going to have Dino from Fear Factory, uh, Mike Gitter, uh, a and uh, who's been on the show, and Scott's good friend, John Wedge Brannon, tour manager, sound man, all people that were very close, and, me and many more, uh, but we're going we're gonna to pay some, some homage to our friend Scott Koenig, who passed away recently. So that is Wednesday, October 27th. Please feel free to, uh, to check into that. What else do I want to mention? Um, what about, oh, you know what? I want to announce, I want to announce this real quick and then, and then we'll, we'll bring our guest on. I am moderating. Come on now. We're doing this. This is going to be literally live. When is this? Saturday, November 8th at Generation Records. I am moderating the book event for J.J. French's new book, Le Twisted Business, Lessons for My Life in Rock and Roll. I will, this, will, this is a live event. I will be on stage uh, moderating this uh, with J.J. Feel free. Uh, it is free. It is free. If it's free, it's for me. So that said, when is, when is that again? Saturday, November 6th right here in La Ciudad de Nueva York. Uh, that said, I think we're good. 
Um, let me see. Everybody behaving themselves. Rick to life hasn't infiltrated yet. Hopefully not. Uh, everybody, yes, rest in peace, Scott, for sure. You know? Yes, JJ French was Seven Dust Manager. Yeah, and he was in a band too. Yeah, if anybody out there hasn't seen that Twisted Sister documentary, I highly recommend it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed it very, very much. That said, get your shoes and socks on, kids. Here we go. Get this together here. What we have here. Here we go. All right. Today's guest is an American bassist and songwriter hailing from the Bronx in New York City. He is known for his work with Altitudes and Attitude, Helmet, and for over 36 years, 10 studio albums, seven live albums, and numerous world tours. He has held, the, he has held down the low end in one of the big four, the thrash metal band Anthrax. Here today to celebrate the upcoming release of his new book, Fathers, Brothers, and Sons, Surviving Anguish, Abandonment, and Anthrax, please welcome Coming at us from lovely East Chester, New York, one of the good guys, Mr. Frankie Bello. <laughs> What's up, Drew? How are you, man? I'm good, buddy. How are what you? What a build up, man. What a disappointment. It's going to be right now. <laughs> Here it comes. The big letdown. <laughs> oh, by the way, you guys, hey, by the way, I was enjoying the guys, the, the string them up, uh, polo ponies, the polo pony, the honeymoon thing, dude. There was so many lines I was giving you. I wasn't on, but there was so many lines for the honeymooners. I was loving that. I didn't want to get on. I just wanted to watch. I, I love the honeymooners, man. It was so good. You know what? We're we're we're, we're you and I. We're, we're we're the same age, basically. Yeah. And like th there was that run there where it was like it was like I think it was Odd Couple, Honeymooners, Star Trek. Right? Dude. It was like like. One, two, three, every night, you know? Dude, you know what's pathetic? Here's my life. And this is, my, my wife says I'm pathetic because I'd still do this. I still have from last, you know, in New York, you're a New Yorker. They, on um, on New Year's Eve, they had the odd couple and the honeymoon yeah. is back to back, right? Over yeah. there, three, four, seven, right? It's like for all night. I tape every one of them. I tape, dude, this still on my DVR from last year. I have no life. There's no life here. That's it. I love I it. No, I have no life. Either I'm, either, wait, hold on. Either I'm doing... Either I'm doing this, or I'm sitting DV, DVRing the odd the, the honeymooners. Yeah, I go from this. I go from they take me off. They take me from here, and from here I go to a van, to a hotel, to an airplane, back to the other hotel, airport, to to a, to a car service. Takes me home. I go in my room, and I just. <laughs> you know what it is, man. It's um. For me now, Drew, you know, have you have you done any shows around this time in COVID time? Yeah. How crazy it is. Yeah. Like just watching because we have a lot of families and shit. I can't. You don't want to bring anything home to your families, so everything's like tight knit shit, dude. You got to be really careful about everything. The, right. You got the mask. You got. The, I can't wear the gloves anymore. It drives me fucking crazy. But um, right. it's it's just so boom. You go into the hotel. Go into the show. Backstage is completely shut up. The promoters literally. Is, is, is that up. what it's like? Like like. This I think this you just did this show, right? I think. I know they yeah, all kind of look the same. But... Aftershock? It looks like Aftershock. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Was that last weekend or something? Yeah, it was last, last Thursday, I think it was. It was great. It was fun, man. A lot of people, all good. You know, it felt good to do what we do, you know, Drew, to get back out and, and feel like you have a, a purpose. Um, because, look, this is – you're looking at me for during COVID, dude. This is it. This is the room. I'm in my basement, and I wrote the book here. Writing music here. This is, you know, if I have to do a video for one of those jam video fucking things, this is my production space. It's a fucking little small basement. It, it means nothing, nothing. <laughs> What's but, going on back there? I see you got Sergeant Pepper, you know. A little bit of everything. It makes me happy. I got the Abner Costello with the, you know, the, meets the monsters, the universal monsters, you know, all the right. good stuff. It's uh, yeah. guitars. I'm out of my wife's way. She's upstairs working, right, during the week. Uh, my son goes to school. He's 15. And um, I'm down here in my... Uh, Bellows basement. It is what so it is. Let's, let's jump right. Let's jump right into it. Um, nope. You know, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna uh, adjust the format a little bit because uh, let's get right into uh, uh, the Ray Hogan says he can't wait to read the book and um, you know I just read the book uh, Fathers Brothers and Sons Surviving Anguish Abandonment and Anthrax. The release date is November second, right on Rare, Rare Bird Lit, right? Let me yeah. let me let me dig out the. Um, let me dig out the cover. Um, 
where the hell is I'll, I'll dig out the cover but why 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 now why what was the impetus for you to to write the book now well drew you know me you know the, the life and all that stuff i'm never home i was never home for, especially around this this whole the last two records before covid obviously and my my co-writer joel mciver we're friends for a long time years and he's uh, there it is and he's been he's been talking to me he said it's it, we have to do this. We just have to make the time. And I, I didn't feel good about, I couldn't focus in on a hotel during a tour, all that, you know, it's tough. Get yeah. your life, life's emotions into a book. So um, this COVID thing happened and man, I'm in this seat as I'm sitting right now, dude, this, this room, this seat right here, you know, he, he, we just have a conversation, Joel and I, and he says, this might be the time. And you know what? It was, it was, just, it just clicked like everybody else. Cause we were, remember in lockdown when New York first got hit hard, dude, it was nobody was going out anywhere, so it was that time. It made all the sense in the world. Because I, to, to be honest, man, I was getting really bummed out and depressed, and really screwed up. I was, I was what the fuck's gonna happen? What are we doing? Protecting my kid, protecting my, you know, all that shit. You're worried about everything. Life was coming in. This was a good, a good way, um, a good way to be creative and just getting it out, getting at that angst, that angst shit, just like a good song, you know, just like the, the shit we grew up on. Was was um so you've known joel a while what's yeah. the joel connection here because i would assume that in a situation like yours connecting with someone like joel really sort of helps to move the damn thing forward right so, yeah he likes to fire on the ass i've been friends with joel because yeah. he you know he he pretty much runs bass player magazine ah uh, he's, 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 he's you know, right i've not met him he's an awesome dude if you haven't met him i highly recommend he's one of the better dudes on the earth so yeah. um is very informative, dude. He knows my life more than I knew about my life, to tell you the truth. <laughs> dude, he can that always helps, dude. Yeah, he, he he knows my history. He could light a fire on one story, and just and you. That's what's crazy about the brain, man. You light a fire, and you just light that match, and it keeps going. The fuse keeps going, and all of a sudden, these these stories open up. You know, from our lives. Yeah, and that's that's pretty much what happened. And we did it like this. Oh, that's good. Oh no, let's go back to this and back and forth, just like you and I are doing right now. This is how the book was written, just writing, jotting shit down. And, and he and he pretty much like recorded it and transcribed it? Yeah. Well, we first the first thing we wanted to do, first thing I said to him, I said, dude, what I want to do, I want to be real. I don't want to be, this is Frank Bellow dictating what I, my life. Fuck that shit. I want to yeah, yeah. be in a, I want to make believe we're in a bar, having a pint, right? Just sitting down, talking about things, right? And, and from the people that have read the book, they feel like it's a conversation. They feel like it's like me just hanging out with them. And I like and it. Does and it does, man. I mean, yes. I, 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 in my notes here, like I have, you know, I love the tone of the book. You know what I mean? It, it was like it, it really comes off that way. It comes off like like you and me talking now, and, and yeah, the tone of it. it. It's it's it has a nice tone, man. Cool, thanks. You know, and what and for my and Drew, you know, what's the hide? We we don't hide things. We're straight ahead. That's the way it goes. I don't want to hide, I, dude. After this thing. Let me tell you something. I opened the box. We were talking about this a little while ago. I opened the box when I got <laughs> two books, like the pre-books, all that stuff, right? I had such a hard time opening this book because that was unveiling my life, dude. It was really, it, it fucked me up a little bit because I said, if I open this, now it's real. See, now I have this thing in my hand and I'll be honest with you, dude, as I hold it, you, you realize, oh shit, now it's real. People are going to know my life and yeah. And, the word raw comes into it, and I mean, because I didn't leave anything. I honestly, I'm I'm drained of all this stuff because I I think it was cathartic, and I think it was important to be honest and just tell everything. There's a lot of shit that went on, you know. But um, yeah. that the at the end of the day, for me, it's about proving that you can brush yourself off after all the shit that you know, all the stuff you go through in your life. Look, if I can do that, I'm hoping that, look, if one person can read this book and feel better about their lives and brush himself off, you know what I mean? Yeah. Then it's all good. You know, I want this for my son. I want him to know that there's a path out there. If, you know, you have some bum days, brush yourself off, man. I think I'm, that's what part of life I'm in now. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I really, I really um, connected to your book. And, par and, and part of the reason is... Uh, in your book, you talk about how incredibly your father walked out on your family yeah. uh, with five kids. Your dad walked out. He had five kids, and he walked he walked off and left your mother to to basically fend for herself with five kids. Yeah. I related to this in the regards that uh, my father, uh, um, uh, my grandfather, walked out 
on um, my on my on, on my family on my father. Uh, he did. He walked out. Uh, there were my father and my uncle, and uh, it was the same thing. Left. You know, he just walked out. And uh, sadly, in, in my dad's case, my dad ended up in an orphanage after that. He ended up wow. in the Israel Orphanage Asylum in the lower in the Lower East Side. Wow. But there, but but there was. Um, but I felt I, I, I felt a, a connection in reading yeah. your book and, and in that situation because in a certain way I, I felt like I'm the next generation like I'm like your son Brandon you know what I mean I, I'm yeah. like because my dad was like you he 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 went through that experience and when he had a family it wasn't going to be like that and love, it really it really it. helped helped shape my dad uh, to be the great person he is so you know. Uh, you know, that, that, I mean, that, that obviously, uh, I mean, if you could just speak on, I mean, obviously that was a big part of, of, of uh, forming who you were as a child. And as now having your father walk out is just traumatic. Yeah. And, and thank you for those great words. And I'll tell you, man, I love your father, by the way, your father, I don't even know him and I love him, but I love any great dad who stands up and stands by his family, period. And look, and I, and Drew, you, you know, Look, that happened a lot of years ago. I don't know what reason it was why he took off. And look, whatever it is, it happened, right? What it does to the kids on the other side, it leaves, and I can speak for myself here, it leaves you this hole, this this yeah. this wanting, this yearning about why. Did I do something wrong? Did, was it my fault? Did I, you know, and then you start looking for a father figure and shit, people just to emulate and just father figures, you know what I mean? You're looking for, I want to grow up and be normal, right? And that, so music became my passion and they were my father figures and my my guidance because music made me feel better. I said, in my in my head, I said, well, if this makes me feel better, it, it probably is the right way to go. So all my, the bass players and all the musicians, they were my like kind of father figures and the guys to carry, to carry me to the next stage and show me the way. Music was the way. It was very lucky to have music in my life. I've been very, very, and I don't, I say that in the book. I'm very fortunate. I know we've had a great career. Thank, thank God for it. Very humbled by it. But anybody who has this, this, this hollowness in them, and I'm still searching, dude, I'm still searching. You know what I mean? You're, you're always looking for that next, you know, hero. You're looking for the hero. I, I think, you know, when I, when I think of anthrax, uh, you know, I always think, uh, of the fact that you guys in a lot of ways are, are a very family oriented band. Yeah. I mean, b between you and your, you and your Charlie, who's your uncle and right. Mike who manages you guys now. Yeah. And it's like anthrax to me, it was always like a very closed knit unit. And I, I guess, you know, that sort of experience, you know, carried on into the band, like families we, is important, man. You know, it is. families, everything. And you know, as a New Yorker, that's very, it's very New York of us, of us. but uh, even with Scott, Scott Ian, Scott, I know Scott since the, I mean, God, the early eighties, he's like a brother. Scott literally is. I've seen him more than my brother, my brother, uh, Chuck, or, you know, uh, or my family. I mean, we've been on the road all our lives. So that's, that's what crazy. happens. It just happens that you, you're together for all, we realize this, you know, we just did this 40th anniversary for Anthrax and you realize how much time you spend together and you've spent together. That wasn't with your family. And it actually, it equals more time with them members than your family. So yeah, it's always been a family member kind of vibe. And look, I'll I'll die a family thing. You know, you know, I'll be that family guy. I don't want to be anybody else. I'm I am who I am. I'm not going to be anybody else. I want to I want to go out like this. Uh, I want to care about family. It's important. And and maybe for some people that don't know out there, when when you're when you're when your family kind of splintered. Um, you went to live with your grandmother, yeah. right? Who mm -hmm. is Charlie's mom? Yeah. So, so a lot of people don't realize that you actually grew up in, in the same um, in the same house as kids with with Charlie Benante, and uh, here you go, boom, right? I mean, that, that's that's wild, and and uh, I mean, so you guys really, you know, you guys were like, I mean, brothers, really. Yeah. I mean, you're really brothers. Yeah, really, we grew up as kind of the brother vibe. And all I'm looking at is my face. I said, what the hell happened? Look at me now. I said, that was a better looking kid. <laughs> he looks the same. <laughs> He's fine. Charlie looks the same. I'm an old bastard now. Yeah. But, um, uh, for, I, I just, look, I got very lucky because I, I, growing up, after my dad took off, I'll give you the quick synopsis of the book with, with my upbringing Please. for everybody who doesn't know. So we grew up, uh, my dad, we, we went to Rockland County. 
And uh, my dad took off. So we couldn't keep the house because after he took off, there's no money. We're on welfare. It got really ugly. Uh, it got really ugly. Like people, uh, notices came in. We were losing the house. So we had to move to Havistro, New York. When, I, when we moved to Havistro, New York, the pathway to get to the school, it was like a lower kind of income vibe. But um, I was getting my ass kicked every day, straight out. I was literally getting my ass kicked every day. And I'm not just saying like a punch here, punch here. I'm talking kick your ass. These two dudes knew where I was going to be, and they waited for me. I just great scarring in my head. They knew where I was going to be. So uh, they, they literally beat me under a car every day. My only, ref, my, <laughs> my only place to get away, I put it in simple terms, was to go underneath the car near the muffler, and so they would stop kicking me. That's, I mean, that's, that's a true story every day. So why I went to my grandmother's house to live was the obvious reason. Just so like physically I, and mentally, I was, a, I was fucked up. Uh, I wasn't going to survive that. I didn't think I survived that. I wasn't going to because there was no way out. And uh, so I went to live with my grandmother, who Charlie, that's his house uh, with my grandmother. He lived with her. And we grew up more as brothers. Charlie was the music. He was always into music. He was a great drummer since he's four years old. And I was always, lo I always loved that. I always said, if Charlie can do music, I want to do music too. And um, he's the first one that showed me guitar. And I got a guitar. And then I, uh, he's the one that told me to switch the bass because I was playing the bass parts on the guitar. I love the bit. I love the bit in the book um, where you literally say, Anthrax started in my house yeah. because when 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 Scotty and and Danny Lilker auditioned Charlie, they came over to your grandmother's house and you were downstairs as those guys. Th that is incredible. That's that. in the Bronx, New York. Um, my the, the house that I love that I grew up in that that was like my oasis from the pain that I had. This beautiful, beautiful house. And again, this is a you know a connected house. It's nothing special, but it was the, for me it was the most beautiful house in the world because it it meant relief and it meant yeah. good times and family. So when I say anthrax, don't take this. Out, I hope people don't take it out of context. It's that the band was started this form of the band before Charlie was in the band. So Charlie Benanti wasn't in the band. Scott and Danny Looker came over to audition, which I was all psyched about. I was psyched because I didn't know these guys yet, but all I did know, dude, when they came over. It was the fucking loud. It was on the top floor, the three floors of the house, right? <laughs> it was the top floor, connected houses. And I was in the kitchen all the way on the basement floor, like my, my grandma's kid. I was sitting with my kid, my grandmother. Dude, the, the low end from that, Scott's guitar, Danny's, Danny's bass, and, uh, and Charlie's kicks. It was the loudest fucking thing. But yeah. Well, da well Danny, Danny Lilker alone. Oh, his, I love Danny. With his, with his, Danny. With his, that guy's bass. Dude, it's big and it's beautiful. It's yeah. big and it's beautiful. And Danny, yeah. one of the more more underrated. And this is not a kiss ass. I've always told him this. He's more one of the more underrated people, underrated bass players out there. Also, aside from a musician. Yeah. Um. So you start with so so you start with guitar. Um. Basically, at yeah. a certain point, you know, these do. You know, you're playing all the sort of bass stuff on the guitar. You switch to bass. Early influences. Who, who came across your radar screen that really spoke to you as a young man? The same ones I still grew up with because I'm a loyal loyal person to, to a fault, but I love these guys. Steve Harris, Getty Lee, Geezer Butler to this day. To this day. And, you know, Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney. Yeah, you know, stuff like that. People who tell stories within the bass lines. I always found that the melodies uh, really interesting. And I still find it interesting to this day. So yeah. they were, my, again, these were not only base heroes, but they were also I, father figures. I have to say that because I looked up to them. I looked up. I said, I want to do that. When I saw Kiss, when I first saw Kiss, I said, that's what I want to do on stage. I want to go up there and fucking go nuts and have people go nuts with me. That's what made me want to do it, dude. Now, uh, you saw Kiss at the Nassau Coliseum in 1977 on the on the Rock and Roll Over Tour. Tell, tell us about that experience. Dude, well, they they um, they had the Destroyer. Um, I remember they had the Destroyer staging still up, right? It was one of those great times. Uh, it was Kiss, man. Back then, there was no there was no social media, there was no MTV, none of none of the things that ruined music. It was all the all the good things that just pure music, pure theater of show. It was uh, look, I was a young kid. 14, whatever it was, 15, it was that time. My heroes were going to be live. That was it, man. The, sh the crowd was insane. It was a local local show for me. Uh, and all of a sudden, my heroes came out and blew me the fuck away. And I, I never saw anything like that. 
it had a big, big influence on me about what I wanted to do with my life. It really did. I, I had to laugh. I had to laugh, chuckle to myself because I, I thought to myself, Nassau Coliseum, 1977. Like, you know, because... You know, I remember seeing shows, just the Nassau Coliseum parking lot. And, really? like, and like that whole scene. It was like, a scene within a scene. It was a scene within a scene, right? Yeah. It was totally a different game yeah. outside. And they used, to, they used to call it the mausoleum, right? I I, I love that. And plus, it's weird to say I'm a New Yorker. I, I love the, I grew up loving the Islanders as a hockey team too. So they used to play there locally. Yeah, so it was all good for me. Was, I felt very comfortable there. I saw a concert once at the Nassau Coliseum. And it, it, it was always like a, an incredibly intense and stressful scene outside, you know, and, and like that whole scene. I saw someone wrap themselves in, American fl in an American flag and jump through the plate glass window uh, of a concert that was sold out. And like there was always cops there. It was Dude. the place. It was it was a crazy place, you know. Cops on horses, even scarier, right? Cops on horses. That That's were, right. That's yeah. right. They had the horse. That's right. Very scary yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Abs absolutely. Um, you uh, and I also love in the book. Uh, first off, you know I love the forward by Gene Simmons. I thought like like he actually spoke in in like like a, a voice I, I've almost never heard him speak in. You know, you got it, man. Seriously, man. Like it's a different. You know, gene. It's a different gene. Yeah, that's it. And and then you know you know him talking. You know the fact that like you know he he grew up in a similar situation. His dad split, and so. You know, you you know, you guys are bonded in, in, in that regard. And I thought his forward was really, um, really uh, touching. It was re it really, uh, it was it was it was really spot on. It was really yeah, good. You know, and I didn't know. Just so you guys know, I didn't know that Gene had that. I knew he was very close with his mom, but I didn't. I never right. asked him the story about his dad. So that when I read that, he came back with it. It hit home, man. I was like, I didn't know. I just didn't yeah. know. And it was so poignant for this book, obviously. And I'm like. Man, it it all makes sense. This is like meant to be that way. And look, the look as Frank Bellow, if you told Frank Bellow, the fifteen year old Kiss fan who was at any of these Kiss shows in, when I was young, that Gene Simmons, number one, I would have a book. Number two, Gene Simmons is going to write the forward. I said, you're out of your fucking mind. But he did, and I'm very proud of it. I mean, it's it, it's so awesome that you 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 loved his band so much. You guys were like, you and your buddy were like, basically stalking him, hanging hanging out outside the studio and everything. It got to the point where he actually knew you guys by name, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, how incredible is that? That all these years later, you're you're in you're in a band that's you know at that level, and and he becomes a peer, yeah. like. I mean, what was that like to, to, to sort of see him like nowadays when you see him? I mean, that, even him, he must feel so good about that. That's so great. He does. Man. He does. And I'm very proud of it. And I tell you, um, just for so the people that out there know, it's, this is all written in the book. These great little stories that we put in. Um, yeah, it's all in the book. When we were young growing up in New York, Bronx, New York. Well, uh, my friend Tom, uh, we're, diehard, we're diehard Kiss fans. So Tom had an in with their management and they would call him to let him know when Kiss was going to have a management uh, uh, meeting. <laughs> He would have these, and he would call me up, dude. He would call me and my friends up. He call, it's on, just like that. We knew it was something to do with Kiss. It's when he on, said, it's on, dude. It's on, dude. So it's go, on. So we go down to um, his management, uh, Kiss's management, a coin manager. Was that Bill? Was that Bill a coin? Bill a coin. Rest his soul. Yes, very nice man. Also, yeah, I worked with him when he managed Billy Idol. Yeah, yeah he was awesome. He was awesome. Yeah. So we went down there. We waited, dude. And you know, New York winters. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. We we went down there, freezing yeah. our balls off, waiting in front of. Kiss management, hours, dude, hours outside, shivering like this, waiting for a few guys with six foot, you know, six foot three, six foot four, with long hair, because nobody knew what they looked like back then. They, had, they always had the masks on. So we would just wait, and we found out, and we became, we were there so often that they started, I remember Gene, Gene telling me, and Gene will say it to this day, Frank Bello, what are you doing here? How did you know we were here? You know, he'll just say stuff like that right off the bat. And because we always, we were always there. It was just one of those great times in our life. It was awesome. When, when you got in, like in the story in the book, you guys get into the studio. Um, <laughs> were, were they, of course, they're not wearing makeup. When he talked to you like that when you were a teenager, was it just no no makeup, nothing? Yeah, this was, um, this was a right track. Was it right track on 48th Street, 48th Street, Manhattan, Tom Brown. Uh, my friend Tommy, um, <laughs> he's so great. He would call me up. Look, I heard the recording. I heard they're in Right Track Studios. So I, we go down Right Track Studios, 48th Street, take Manhattan, you know, Manhattan Express, you know, the bus. 
you know, we right downtown, drop us yeah. off. We get there. I'm afraid to go in. There's a camera at the studio. Security, yeah. right? Tommy buzzes. I said, don't do that. I'm trying to grab his hand. He buzz, buzzes. There's a camera. Can I help you? Yeah, we're here. Tommy, God rest. I'm back here. We're here up. to see Gene. We're here to see Gene, dude. I'm scared. Yeah. I'm, I'm shitting in my pants. Because I don't want any problems with I don't want any problems with Kiss. I want them to like me, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Tommy, man, he goes, come on, opens the they click the door open. They open the Tommy, Tommy had balls, man. Yeah, Tommy had balls of steel. I, I didn't have those balls. I say that right now. But so he opens his door. It's just like two kids. Like, come on, come on. No, I'm not fucking going. Come on. So you get, I'm walking in like molasses on my fucking, like I'm, I'm walking in mud. I'm not right. going in this. To the end of a hallway where there's an elevator going up the stairs to, uh, up the, up the, to the studio. He presses the button. Ding. I can't believe these people are letting us up. I, I don't want to go up. Long story short. Elevator comes in. Come on, get it. We get in the elevator. I'm going up. Dude, there's three floors. One, two. Please don't open. Please don't open. Door opens, dude. Studio. You see the front desk. Imagine this shit. I'm out of my mind scare. I'm, I think I'm going to get my ass kicked by security any second now. I'm this kid who's going to get beat down by kiss security. I'm worried. Nobody's at the desk. We can see it. I wouldn't walk out the door. I won't walk out the elevator door. Tommy, of course, runs right out. He's looking around. He said, come on, come on. I said, all right. Fuck, I take my step out. Elevator fucking door closes, right? Oh, fuck, all right? Look over to my left. There's a wall blocking this, this side room, but you can see two cowboy boots just laying on some kind of couch. You can see somebody's relaxing, watching TV. We take that next step. We look over. It's Gene Simmons, right? Dude, dude who's who's in life in real life, even without the gear, is a big guy. He's, he's a big dude, and he's he's, he's a, a great dude. dude. I love him, right? So we I we look over and Tommy's stoked, and I'm shitting in my pants because we do not belong there. We 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 weren't invited here. So Gene yeah. is sitting watching after a take. He's he's, he's he's taking a relaxation time. He's watching TV with, with some cookies in his in his hand, you know, with an, a plate, and he's with and he looks up. We're here, we're right here, and he looks up. And then he just put. The, I heard this side. Oh, like oh, so these kids. Like, these got these got They fat. They how how did these kids find me again? Yeah, I can't. And he knew it was us. You know, and we were. This was at the time where Gene knew us pretty well, but we were always there, right? And I felt. God forbid, God forbid, it's a bunch of like good-looking broads. No, Instead, I, it's a no. bunch of teenage teenage. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so long story short, Gene looks 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 at us. Uh, the side comes, looks down at his cookies. He goes, and he looks back at, what are you doing here? Dude, that's the voice of God talking right now. I'm, I'm so fucking you do, you do a good imitation. Yeah, Jesus. thanks. He goes, what are you, what are you doing here? And Tommy right away, we, we just want to hear some songs. Tommy had this high-pitched voice. We hadn't reached puberty yet, so we had this high-pitched voice. So we just wanted to hear some songs. He had the ball oh. to say we wanted to hear some songs. Oh. We're, we're invading the studio space. Now he wants to hear some songs. So I said, Gene, we could leave. I'm just like, no, Gene, no. And he looks down at his cookies again. And then Gene, out of nowhere, would you like to hear a song? Ah, God, fucking the heavens open, dude. It was like, oh my God, fucking fandom time. It was amazing. Tell me right away before I can even open my mouth. Of course, yeah, yeah. And Tommy had this high voice. Let's, yeah, we want to hear a song. And what was that song? I, I listened. I actually went and listened to the song that you said he what was it. Youth, um, young and wasted. Young and wasted, and he sings it. He yeah, sings it's, that one. It's a great that's song. A Gene, that's a Gene song. It's a Gene yeah. song with Eric Carr I, on, on, on drums. It's it's incredible. But I, yeah, yeah, I listen so he to said, it. So Gene, he calls the engineer. He goes, "Hey, this, I have some friends here. They're going to come inside and listen to a song. Um, just let them in and listen to it." So, <laughs> where I'm, dude, I'm, I should have a diaper on at this point because I know I squirted out something. It was I was going fucking nuts walking into that, that is, studio. That's he sits down. Song's amazing. We come out. He goes. So how did you like it? We're fucking over over the edge. We love everything. Life is great. Thank you, thank you so much, Gene. Blah, 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 blah. He goes, now you've heard the song. I've offered you my. He, he offered us some cookies, which was great. I said no. Tom took one. Um, so at the end of the day, he goes, now I've I've made you hear a song. I've offered you some cookies. Now can I get back to work? And I was like, okay, Gene, okay. And Tommy goes, yeah, but one more question. Oh, go ahead. I love the bit that he said, like. Um, do I come into your living room unannounced? Do I mean, do, do I come to your place of work on an, like, it's so true in a certain way, you know, it's like, oh. Yeah, I didn't know if you wanted to hear that. I'll give you that speech, that he, a little bit of speech he gave us. So as he was looking down at his cookies, I think he was just like, 
in this kind of comfortable space. Like he didn't want to be bothered at that time because I think yeah. he just got through some takes and he wanted to relax. So after he, after he says, what are you doing here and all that stuff? He goes, do I come and invade your space when you're at home in your living room? Uh, yeah. Do I do that? And Tom Brown right off like, Real quick, because of course you can come anytime. You know, anytime, Gene. You can anytime, anytime you want. Tom's like so quick, and so so oh. Gene, he just puts his head down again. Oh, that's when he gave in and said, "Would you like to hear a song?" And right. that, you know, that's, that's what the song goes. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna throw the flag here, come on. and uh, let's let's bring on uh, Sid the Kid. Sid, hey, Sid. what do you say? Yo, Sid? what's going on, guys? What you All got right. there, Sid? What kind of bass you got there? I can't see. It's a uh, Fender Starcaster, actually. Ooh. Long story short, neck was messed up. Got it replaced. It, I never even heard of that. Trust me, I looked this up. I thought it was a bogus base till I looked up the model. And That's it was like cool. the most offshoot fen Fender models they made. Yeah. Again, I said the, the neck I still have, it's warped, shot to shit. Went yeah, to so you, you, put, you replaced it then, the whole neck. Oh, yeah. And honestly, oh. it plays even better. Wow. Like, That's down, great. I mean, basically, I wanted. I know someone's gonna ask this in the chat eventually. Like, if you bring up your band, you Sid, it. what? I'm not playing the bass. I'm just holding it <laughs> for effect. Let's do album of the week, Sid. All right. All righty. Whenever you're ready, all Mr. Right. Stone. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Album of the week. Boom. Ah. Oh, boom. Oh. All right, Sid. All right, Sid. You got the floor. Go, Sid. All righty. Well, you know, today I wanted to focus on an album that does really resonate with today's guest. And no better album to talk about than Rush's eighth studio album entitled Moving Pictures, which was, I believe, recorded at Lay Studio in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, in October and November of 1980 and was later released, I believe, on February 12th, 1981. Uh, this was released on Anthem Records with the band and Terry Brown producing this. Uh, you know, when we talk about iconic album covers, believe it or not, some say this would pop up, some say it wouldn't, but I believe uh, Hughes, uh, Hughes uh, Syme did this, if I'm not mistaken. You know, as a note here, you know, this was the first of many albums that Neil Peart, you know, obviously played on this album. This was his first record that re he recorded with the band, you know, with such singles as Limelight, Tom Sawyer, which is the very first track on this record and Vital Signs. This was their best-selling record, and it actually still is, uh, I believe, in the United States, selling over 5 million copies to date. And, you know, when you really hear this record overall, you can definitely tell there's more, you know, the st song structure is definitely shorter and more compact writing compared to their, you know, their earlier material. You know, just the album itself has received such positive reception from current and retrospective music critics to this day has become, you know, a commercial success, really. You know, reaching number one in Canada and number three in, in the States and United Kingdom. It remains their highest selling album in general. I mean, how can you go wrong with this record? You know, uh, let's see. Can't hear you, Drew. I don't know. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. I muted go. myself. Well All done. Right, go for it. Well, well done, Sid. Um, I want to say first about this. Um, I love that they, they recorded it Lay Studio. There's that, that, that famous Canadian uh, recording studio. There's a video of them um, doing, I don't know if it's from this record, but, uh, but yeah, th this, this record uh, um, is, is, is incredible. Um, Frankie, yes. does this resonate with you? Give resonate. us your take on it. You read the book. It's, this is a big training. I, I call this a training record for me. <laughs> Literally, this made me really dig into bass even more deep deeply i mean i remember going to records and stuff in the bronx here buying this record and non-stop instead of going out with my guido friends on a friday night i bought this <laughs> and spent my money on this and i learned that i had to learn each and every song every little part that's that that getty lee did i had to and i'm still i still go over it uh it's just one of those great great records that has everything every musician on that they're all amazing obviously the songs are great this these little intricate parts that are just so beautiful and tasty that you want to get it right. Uh, I can listen to this record now in, in its entirety and feel completely satisfied. It's one of those great records in life. It really is. Yeah. You know, did, did I see, um, did I see maybe it was Charlie took a picture in front of this building recently. Yeah. I, I looked for that. I couldn't find it. Yeah. He, but, but, uh, he posted, I didn't post it. I took the same picture because I mean, obviously we'd get to travel around a lot with our touring, yeah. but, uh, where is this? It's in uh, what the hell's Toronto. It's in it's in Toronto. I just forgot the name of the place. Yeah. 
Looks but like an opera house, yeah. It's, it's one of those places that um, when you see it, you have this picture right there with the guys with the red suits on. You put it in your brain and you envision it. It's like, oh my God. And Charlie's the one that told me that was it. I didn't realize it. And he said, yeah, this is it. I was like, oh, fuck, man, this is awesome. Here's the, uh, here's the back of the cover. It's pretty great as well, you know? Oh, uh, dude. So think about it. If, if you have never heard of Rush, if I mean, you've probably heard of Rush. Everybody, people listening, if you never gave Rush a chance, this is a record just to, to dip your toes in and just get it. And you know what I mean? It's one of those, you can get, you can relate to some of these songs. Yeah, there's a lot of great musicianship in this. There's also melody. There's also great vocals, great, just great sounds, just great song structure. And I, I can't sell this work, this record enough because for me, it's very special and it'll always be. It'll always be great. You know, when me and Sid were talking about um, album of the week, my suggestion at first, this is before I started reading the book, was Fly By Night, which yeah. I love. I love that. I love that. I love that record. Yeah. That record was like, that where it was big in my world at the time. I loved Rush Fly By Night. But then I started reading the uh, reading the book and, I, and, and you were talking about... Um, you know, getting up in uh, on, on you you actually knew you knew the exact date, February twenty first, nineteen eighty one. Rush's Moving Pictures came out, and you went to records and stuff on Westchester Square, and like you didn't go out the night before because you had to go buy this. This was a focus, man. It was it was it was life right there because you know what? It was in the I call this a training record because. This was going to get me to that next stage. I felt like this was a very important place to be with bass. I knew where Getty was. I wanted to see his next thing he was going to do. And and just Rush in general, I think it got my chops up. It really, it was a challenge. I love that fucking challenge to this day, man. You know, I was just listening to um, Exit Stage Left yesterday. I was just jamming to it. You know, you just pick out, pick out records. Uh -huh. and it, I, I want to get, you want to get sharp. If you want to feel sharp when you're playing, yeah, those 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 are the ones, man. Well, it says something that when this record came out, if you could play along to this record, it, that that that's that says something, bro. Well, it says that you're dedicated. For me, I was obsessed, though. I mean, my problem right. is I don't let it go. Now, th remember these days, there's no like you have to go to the, the fucking yeah. vinyl and go yeah. <laughs> back to yeah, listen right. to the songs. Right. That's how I train myself. I never learned how to read music. You know, with back, Barrett, back, you know, put the yeah, needle back, back, put the needle so back. back and back. What would you do there? Uh, there's no YouTube I could look at. There's nothing back then. Right. It's right. straight away. Exactly. It's straight air. Yeah. Sid, this well, was my memory. Like, to, when you want to know any record that you want to learn, yeah. you just play to the point. So, not saying you get sick of it, yeah. but you'll know it by the point where you hit it. You're like, you will match those notes every single time. And the satisfaction, Sid, you're right about this. And the satisfaction of that, that moment. After you listen to it a thousand times, the repetition and everything else, that moment when you finally have it down and you are jamming with the band, that's that's the best. That's a drug, right? That's the drug where you just like, it all pays off. It's like fuck yeah, now I could jam this thing. That's what it was for me with Rush and the other bands I grew up with. By the way, exactly. Rob Rob King, Rob King, and as well as uh, Manuel says, it is the Ontario Legislative Building. Uh, thank you, thank you yeah. for correcting me, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Our people are good like that. They are good like that. Thank <laughs> they, you. they are. You, I, I don't even look stuff up. I just ask, and then it turns up. I thought it was in Sid, Toronto. I was wrong. Sid, you did. Uh, Sid, you hit it. Ray Hogan says you hit it out of the park today. Sid, well you done, young man. Well, see, but Drew, oh, you wait, get wait, the I know, credit. Oh, for this oh, one. I know. I got it. I got it, Sid. Here, here. No, no, Sid, Drew, you're getting the credit for this one because it wasn't Frank. I'll tell you what the other album was. Mm. It was actually uh, Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. I th and he another, was like, no, that's tough. That's that's a tough one, right? I mean, two great records, right? Exactly. Once I read that in the book, though, I was like, all right, Sid, what do you what do you got going on, Sid? Well, guys, you know, as things are opening up again, you know, I'm doing the show more and more, and obviously, you see right there, I'm gonna be doing my radio show uh, this coming Wednesday night at I believe 7 p.m. New York time. Uh, you can be sure to go to mixlr.com backslash SDK sound system. You know, I archive all the shows. I've been getting tons and tons of stuff. And I know bands have been sending me stuff. Obviously, you know, I want to play more newer stuff. There's nothing wrong with the classics, but, you know, how is the music going to keep going? We need to play more newer material from, like, you know, it's like so many underground bands. And that's what keeps it going. You know, it just the underground scene does keep it going, Drew. All right, Sid. I'll talk to you soon. All righty, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Um, before we bring our guests back real quick, I want to shout out, um, I want to make an announcement that tonight there is a memorial 
for one of our A7 family that passed away, Sharpie, um, part of the A7 uh, Rampage Mosh crew, passed away uh, a little while ago. There's a show tonight, Reaching Out is playing, um, Enrage. So uh, Kevin Craig, thank you for reminding me. Uh, the show is tonight at Pugs in Staten Island. So um, go on out and, and, and at 7 p.m. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And also just the last note on here, Frankie. Uh, our friend Mike Pooch says, I saw them at Radio City Moving Pictures Tour. Blew me away. Absolutely. Pooch, how are you, Pooch? What's up, Pooch? <laughs> And you see, Pooch, we got the Scott Koenig thing going down. Yeah, you knew, dude, Scott, you knew Scott, right? I love Scott. Scott was yeah. He was he's a longtime friend from the early days with Anthrax. Yeah. And, um, actually, he helped the whole connection with Chuck, with Public Enemy and Chuck D for yep. bringing the noise with us. So it was very. We were just talking about that with Chuck the other day. Scott Koenig was one of the the good guys in our music business. He was one of the good guys, and it, it, you know he was a connector. Yep. He a lot of people love Scott. And I I didn't even know it was this bad to tell you the truth. But it hit me hard. I had no idea. God rest yeah. his soul. Scott was one of the good guys. He really was. Yeah, he was. Um, let me find. Let me just remind everybody that um, <clears throat> Wednesday, October twenty seventh, we're going to do a uh, a tribute to Scott here oh, on. Man. You know, Scott. Uh, you know, this one hits me hard too. I, I was close with Scott. Um, you know, at one point he was one of my best friends, you know, and he moved to California and, and sort of the distance played heavy, but, you know, Scott, uh, put me on, you know, all that stuff I did with biohazard back in the day. And, and, uh, he's one of the good guys, man. So that's, that's one of those guys, you know, it's funny because it's, it's, it's sad because I just saw him at the rainbow. Yeah. Last my son was at the rainbow having, you know, we all went, went out after we were doing some studio stuff out there and I just saw him and I, it, everything seemed okay. You know, everything seemed cool. Yeah. And, and that's, it's, it's like that. I just didn't see that coming, you know? Rest yeah. Of yeah, yeah. Um, you know what's interesting uh, that I found somewhat interesting? Mm. You never did drugs. You never smoked pot. I love the smell of pot. I love the smell of pot, dude, because it brings me back to concerts when that, that time. Sure. Was, <laughs> At the like, Nassau Coliseum Nassau in 1977. It right? gets you going, right? I love the smell, yeah. but I can't. I can't smoke it because it fucks up my throat pretty good. But I love I love the smell of weed. It probably would calm me down. I could probably use some. But um, I, I, drugs, you know, I have some good friends of mine go down. And look, people make their own choices. I get it. But I Absolutely. saw some really good people go down because of drugs. And from the early days, you know, it's not the way I grew up. It's just I for me, it just didn't make sense because if I did that, it was going to stand in the way of getting – to the base that I want, you know, and, and music. I think that would, that, I always thought that would stand in the way of, of something. And after all the shit that happened to me in my in my life with the whole father thing and all the abandonment shit, I said, no, nothing's going to stop me. That that could be stopping me from what I want to do. So it didn't make sense, you know? I'm glad yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's actually pretty rare that, you know, here comes a guy that gets into a, you know, a big world, you know, a uh, traveling band sells millions of records, and thankfully, you never went down that road. Although, although I, I, I did get a kick about the part in the book that you weren't much of a drinker until you ended up going out on tour with 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 Pantera, yeah. where you know you have to drink; they make you drink. Dude, it's uh, that was the real deal. And again, it's, it's, you know, it's funny. We're going. It's I keep saying funny, but I mean sad. It's because life is so fast, and all these great people in our lives. That have yeah. passed now. I, I still can't put it in my head that Dimebag and Vinny are still past. It's crazy. They're, 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 they're past now. I can't believe they're past because they are the spice of life. And when right. I think of, when I think of this, that tour you're talking about, uh, Pantera Anthrax, easily one of the e most fun things I've ever done in my life. Scared the shit out of me because my liver was going on its way out. There's no doubt. Because I, I never drank like that before. I was right. great. Dude, I remember coming home. My wife looking at me, she goes, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that was great, dude. And, and you know, coming off that first leg of the tour, I remember going to the store. The first thing I bought was a bottle of scotch, a bottle of fucking scotch and, and, and a big bottle of Coke soda because I was, I was continuing the black tooths. The party was still going. That's how I knew. Bring it back. Bring it back because that was going. But, look, that was all in fun. They were the Van Halen, and I say this. Yeah, Finally, I say this with all, uh, all good things in my heart. They were the Van Halen of metal because 
they knew how to go have a good time and they played at the top at the top of their of the of, of musicianship and everything else the shows intensity music um it's just they had the, a run they had a run there that they were they were on they were on top of the heap they they were they were untouchable hey shout out to Alan Robert from Life of Agony can't wait to read the book Frankie excited for you love you Robert yeah. Alan Roberts I'm, I can't read uh Alan give me a call tell him can I, I'm translating through this I could just text him myself oh uh, you could actually speak and he'll hear you <laughs> Alan love you <laughs> love you say hello to the family oh that's great um let's I want to talk about this place here. Boom. Oh, the Moors, huh? Wow. Yeah. Dude, look at that. that that brings back so many memories, right? Yeah, I thought I thought this photo itself sort of says a lot. You know? It does. It, That's it, you know. Our youth. That's our youth, my friend. You know. Now your your first show ever when you joined Anthrax was uh, February twenty fifth, nineteen eighty five, uh, nineteen eighty four. Excuse me. Tell us a little bit about your first show, uh, the Lamore's Mystique, and all that. Well, Lamore's Mystique, just so everybody knows out there, this was the place to play back in those days. So you, you could attest to Drew, right? So yeah. it was the place they paid the best out of everybody. Let's face it, the, you know, Parenti brothers were great guys. I love those guys. They were good friends, good friends to Anthrax also. They really took care of us. And that was the place where all the bands, metal bands on this thing came up and we're playing there. So that was the place. My first show in 84 was there. Um, and talk about a kid, a, a guy coming from the Bronx bedroom right to the, my first show. Imagine that. So all I knew was emulating my guys on my bed. My, my stage was my bed, right? So I, I would stand up and try to get my shit down, how I'm gonna, how I'm gonna perform live, all that stuff. <laughs> my big move was jumping off my bed. I would, I would make, you know, I was make believe I was Steve Harris and all this shit. I was, I did all this shit just to get in that zone of how am I going to perform live? This place was my first show. And this is actually a video of this. It's on YouTube. Somebody sent it to me. That's wild that there's a video of it. You could see my young Guido hair coming from the Guido to the rocker hair. Right? Chuck, Chuck, Chucky Brown, our resident historian, says Lamore was his first gig at 18 years old. Death Rider was the first song. Right on. Exactly. Hi, Chucky, by the way. I love yeah. him. Um, yeah, dude, that was... Um, it was incredible, scary at the same time. And I remember, and I say this in the book, I remember there's a click that happened in the back of my neck that I thought I fucking snapped my neck. <laughs> first, first song, I remember first or second song, and then for his death rider, you know, you're just getting into it. The anxiety, all that shit's coming out. I just, I heard, I, what the fuck was that? Man, you keep it going because you don't want to fuck <laughs> up, right? I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm thinking all these things. I'm trying to. I'm trying to play this song at the same time, and I'm thinking, "Oh my God, my neck is broke. I broke a fucking bone. I broke a fucking bone." <laughs> Dude, I'm, it's it's like it was like this burning. I still remember it to this day. It was like a burning going through my neck. I said, like, "Did I break my fucking neck just now? Did I break?" And I'm I'm gonna have to cancel my first show. <laughs> All this shit's happening right there, right there. Thank Big. God, I, I you know I went through it, got through it. The adrenaline kicked in. Thank God, yep. got through the show, and it went it went over great. I was I was really. Freaked out the whole thing. My neck was okay. Blah blah blah. Iced down, uh, but still, that place was very special to me in my life. It really was. Uh, shout out to Astoria Lou. Says I caught King Flux, Exodus, and Anthrax at the Ritz on June fourteenth, nineteen eighty six. Wow, dude, good, yeah. good one right there too. Another good show. That was yeah. That was I mean, that was the Ritz. That was the. That was the new Ritz, which was the old Studio 54, right? Yeah, right. They called it the Ritz. Remember, it's still, but it still had all the Studio 54 things. Like the, it was all still like scurvy and stuff. There's all that shit on the floor. I was crazy. All the you know, you know just, the just, just as a side note, uh, not too long ago, I went and saw a play there because it's, it's like a theater now. And 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 I went with a gal um, that I was dating at the time, and I said, you know, this place has a lot of history. This, this, not only was it, you know, we were sitting up in the balcony there. I said, you know, not only was it Studio 54, yeah. but I saw Guns N' Roses here. I mean, saw Motorhead here. Like, uh, before, here's a shot. This is kind of a great one. It, it was, it was in the archive. This is the Lamore crowd. Dude, you know, there Lamar. you go. And that's just so you guys know, I'm watching this right now, if, if you've never been like in Lamore's, if you're never at Lamore's, if, you, if you're too young for that stuff. This right here, if you're from the stage right where this photographer is taking this picture, it's a great picture, by the way. I don't know who took it. 
But e easy, easy Ed Esposito took this photo. Great shot, dude. But yeah. you're getting the vibe of that. But what you're not feeling right there, which you can't feel because it's it's physical, you feel the heat come right. up in a wave, right? Right, Drew? You come up, there's a wave that comes up right there. Of I actually see two, three females of the species in there, which okay. is, which, and, and, which, and, and if, the, if, if, if they were female and yeah. they were Lemores, yeah. they were known as Lemorsals. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> we're going to Lemores to pick up some Lemorsels. Um, good time. Uh, Lou, yeah, Lou, Lou says, no, it was at the old Ritz on 11th Street. My bad, buddy. My, 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 my bad. Oh, good correction. Um, I, I stand corrected. Um, you know what? I need to take a break. Go but, ahead. But, 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 but you I'm know what? Wait, wait, wait a second. I got, wait, where's Steven? Yo, you here, bro? I'm here. Hey, I got some of your pictures. That, hold on. I got to dig out. Where's those pictures? Uh, here we go. Uh, these have never been seen before. Uh, Steven took these, Frankie. Um, here, this is, this is from, I guess, you, you tell us where these are from. This is from Sundance, right? Oh, yeah. This is walking into Sundance. Oh, God. Look at those shorts, dude. What am I so much? Oh, <laughs> dude, you're, dude, you're winning with those nut dude, hoppers, man. That was, that was the 80s. Those, that was the 80s right there. I, look, I, I got to own it. My balls were probably sticking out. Hanging <laughs> <laughs> where, where is this from, Stephen? Uh, Anthrax Metal Church, Among the Living Tour wow. at Sundance. Holy shit, dude. That's yeah, a this was time ago. unbelievable. I'm sorry. I apologize to everybody in the shorts. Oh my god! But wait, but wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. <laughs> oh, there is. <laughs> but wait, it's a little out of focus. But listen, no, no sense. Just throw. Might as well throw the rest of your guys under the bus too. Yeah, already, let it right? happen. There you go. Oh yeah, there's everybody. <laughs> there's everybody right there. That was those are the times right there. Woo! Joey, like, Joey Belladonna with the Daisy Dukes. Oh, yeah. Joey's yeah. taking sun. Joey Joey loves taking the sun, so that's what he was doing. He's taking – just getting sun. God, and I remember Art, a guy sitting on the on the, on the the road case right there was a longtime crew guy, Artie Ring, right there. He's oh, wow. The guy, and this is a little tidbit right there. The guy in that picture on – Artie Ring right there, just so you guys know. Yeah. You know the song Caught in the Mosh? Yes, of course. That title came from him, and here's why. He's the guy that got caught – in, in, in the, the mosh, in the, in the mosh pit, right? And we got they got him out of there. We asked him, Artie, what happened? He goes, Oh, dude, I was caught in a mosh. Oh, that's yes. how it happened. God, I love history him. was I made. Him. Wow, dude, he's awesome. That's is a that, great shot. Is that John Tempesta next to Spitz? No, no, that's me. That's him. That's Frankie. You see the short shorts I have on? Yeah, that's gotta be <laughs> my balls Man. hanging out. You can see my left balls hanging low. Well, but um, yeah, that's Danny. Yeah. I, I don't, Charlie's in the back with the the red hat. I think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's Charlie. I didn't even notice that. That's Charlie. Fink. Charlie had long hair yeah. back then. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and and there's uh Mr. Mr. Tan himself, Joey Belladonna. Joey Belladonna. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. You know, we we don't we're the same. That's what we do now. We just walk around backstage. You wait. What do you do? You wait for the show. <laughs> that's great. Well, well done, well done, Stephen. Nice. Oh, thank you. That you that was dug all those, kind of stuff, dude. Thank you. Out. Hey, oh, hey, can I? <laughs> Hold on. Joey Belladonna is the George Hamilton of Brash. <laughs> 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 All right, Stephen. What, what do you got, Stephen? I what I just want to say was uh, you were talking about the Nassau Coliseum before. Yeah. And Frankie, what I, one of my best memories was not only the show, but that was back when you used to have to go to the Coliseum to get tickets. Yeah, man. And oh, we would get oh. dropped off and wait online to get tickets, and you ended up making all these friends. You didn't know what tickets you were getting, yeah. and then like a month later, you would see them. And it was like a part of the experience, like just waiting in the parking lot and who had a boom box and was playing the, you know, the new record and whatever. And it was, it was such a great time. And you said the right word experience. That's what I feel bad for these people out now. The people doing this now, there's no experience like that. There was a whole event. The show is secondary, right? The show is the big, oh, yeah. course. but the leading up to it, that whole experience you just talked about is so missing. And I wish they had just for people's like just the fulfillment of life. I wish they can do that. And get that like talking like we do, you know, about the ticket. What ticket you get? What are you sitting? You're all well, yeah. and you right. see each other. It's it's a great experience, man. I wish people can do that again. It was it yeah, was sure. such a classic thing, you know. It and was, uh, was. I um, remember you going to the record store to get tickets at like the Ticketron and all that. Ticketron. Ticket yep. Ticketron. Remember Ticketron? 
I remember, you know, at the same store I bought my, my Rush record out, records and stuff, we used to have Ticketron in their place. So we bought our tickets there. It was easy enough. So you just bought, I bought the records and, and everything else there. It was a one-stop shop. Classic. All right, Stephen, we'll talk to you soon, buddy. Thank you. Great job, Stephen. All right. That was cool. That's good. I love, I love that stuff because I haven't, just so you know, I've never seen those pictures. And I have so much stuff going around in my head for my, my history. Just those times. They were great times, man. We were very lucky. We were very, very fortunate. I, I'm, I'm very thankful. And I'm looking at it, man. Life is fast. Life is very you guys, fast. You guys worked very hard. Um, you guys were a very hardworking band, man. I mean, I mean, I remember you guys were always on the road. You were always working hard, man. I mean, you guys were a hardworking band, man. Still are. I mean, when we can. But, you know, th thank you for that, Drew. But, you know, th th that's the whole story. I think people see the tour buses and stuff like that and, and the bigger stages and stuff. I don't think when you look back at Lamores, you look back at these shows and coming up of, of the band and stuff with, you know, I remember $5 per diem per day to eat right, you know, right. per day. How do you make, how do you stretch $5 for breakfast, lunch, and dinner to eat every, you know, three meals a day. <clears throat> Those days in the van, the van tours, you know, everybody, the band and crew, suitcases, gear, everything in one van, farts, smelling, BO, all that stuff. That's great stuff. It's all great stuff, but you look back and those are the best times of our life. That's awesome. On that note, let's take a break. Um, sure. Let me, let me shout out some sponsors. Uh, if you need to get up and, and grab a bite or go to the bathroom, we'll see you back in about five or 10 minutes. I'll be right back. Thank you. Well, there you have it. What's happening. This is the New York hardcore Chronicles live often imitated, never duplicated. Uh, welcome. Our guest today is Frankie Bello and uh, he has a new book out. Uh, Fathers, Brothers, and Sons, Surviving Anguish, Abandonment, and Anthrax. The release date is November 2nd on Rare Bird Lit. I uh, want to mention a couple of things real quick. Um, Sunday matinees are back on the Bowery. Coming up on Sunday, November 7th, we're doing, as part of our Back to the New York Hardcore Roots series, Dog Eat Dog, Kings Never Die, Crazy Eddie, Chucky Brown Represent, and Dead Crew. The show is free. If it's free, it's for me. It's all ages. Also, going on at the same event upstairs, I am doing a book release for this, for the book, The New York Hardcore Chronicles, Volume 1, 1980 to 1989, upstairs from the Bowery Electric. The book will be available. They are numbered, and I will sign it. If you cannot make it and you would like to buy the book, it is available at www.stonefilmsnyc.com. Buy the book. Support the show. They are numbered. I will sign it and write down something nice for you. This show is November 7th. Uh, that's right, Lenny. Don't mess around. Get your ass down to the show nice and early and come see your friends. Yep, for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. So... Buy the book, please. Uh, lots of orders came in. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, want to, oh, got to mention this one too while we're at the Bowery Electric. Sunday, December 5th, The Take. It is our record release show. Uh, so it's The Take, Antidote, NYHC, Enziguri, Non Residence, and Fire is Murder. Free, all ages. Sunday matinees are back on the Bowery. Don't be scared. Come on down. December 5th, um, festivities start at 2 o'clock. So there you go. Want to mention a couple other uh, shows that are coming up. Um, Sunday, November 14th, former road manager for the Rolling Stones and the Grateful Dead, Sam Cutler, will be on the show. This is going to be epic. This guy's down in Australia um, reading his book, You Can't Always Get What You Want. Sam Cutler's book, uh, great book, great read. I highly recommend it. Can't wait to chop it up with Sam Cutler about the Rolling Stones and, of course, the Grateful Dead. Wednesday, November 17th, Jason Bittner, drummer extraordinaire. Uh, actually, there's an Anthrax connection because he sat in with Anthrax a couple times, apparently, right, when, when, uh, when Charlie couldn't make it. Jason Bittner from Overkill Shadows Flaw. Flaw, Flaw. Shadows Flaw, uh, Flotsam and Jetsam, and of course, 
upstate New York represent uh, stigmata. Jason Bittner on November 17th. Uh, that said, then we got, you know, I'll, I'll hold off on this one. I think I covered a lot. Hey, if you don't know, there is a Patreon, a patron page, Patreon, Patreon page. Um, if you're a patron, you get the book for free. Please feel free to support this show. Things don't magically happen. Things do magically happen, but not this show. Um, so please, and I, I appreciate, you know, one thing I, one thing I want to mention, I want to thank all the Facebook pages out there um, that allow me to post up when I have a show. There's a lot of them, and, and I've never thanked them. There, there's many old school hardcore kids and all the hardcore pages, all the thrash, all the thrash metal pages. Um, you know, I do a whole big uh, social media thing every morning of the show. And if you're listening and you're involved with one of those pages, I want to thank you for letting me post and, and helping uh, to push this show forward. Um, yes, Lenny, <laughs> buy, buy, buy a show, um, buy, buy a book. Um, hey everyone, it's Craig Satari. Great show and much. Oh, oh, when we get Frank back. All right. Craig Satari, Wally Wolru. All right, Craig. Didn't realize that was you. Um, let me, uh, let me bring Frankie back on. Hey, Fra hey Craig Satari says, hey, uh, Craig said, great show and much respect to Frank. Uh, who, was all, who was always good to me, especially when I was a little kid. He, to me, he's always that little kid because I love him. I have it like a brother. I love that. <laughs> old school, old school, look, old school friend that never changed. And I love it about him. You know what I mean? That's yeah. one of the good guys. Yeah. Turned out to be a hell of a bass player. Too. Totally. Dude, I'm so proud. Come on, man. That's, yeah. see, I feel like a father image here because I, I see these kids grow up and it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's nice. Yeah. Awesome. Hello, you know, Craig. you know, uh, Hey, listen, we're going to do questions later. We're going to do all that stuff in a little bit. So hold off on the questions. Let's, uh, let me keep, uh, let me keep doing my thing. We'll take questions, you know, in about a half hour or so. So, so hold, hold your horses, hold your horses on that. Um, you know, now I, I guess I got, I got to prioritize and, and, uh, and a little bit here, but you know, you know, one thing interesting from, from the book and, and you just reminded me uh, as you're saying that about, sort of, um, there was a point in the book where you're talking about uh, the band's doing pretty well, you're out there doing tour, you're selling records, and you still, you, you come back and uh, you're still working at Joe's Deli. Um, and my notes are, still working at Uncle Joe's Deli when signed to a major label and selling records. And it reminded me of when you hear like, and not, not in your case, but you've heard this, like, I sold a million records and I'm broke. And Maybe you can give us some perspective on, you know, how the machinery worked back then. People think, oh, you know, uh, you guys sold them. You guys should be rich when, in fact, this, you know, tour support, like, like that whole pit. And literally, you could sell a million records and be broke. Give us a little perspective on that. Yeah, just because you signed to a major label doesn't mean shit. Honestly, everybody knows this. I mean, it's great. Yeah, the major label, all that stuff. We went to Island Records, which was great. Great, you know, the step up, all that stuff. It was Megaforce, Island Records. It was great. But at the end of the day, you know, you just said it. Tour support, buses, you know, crew, crew, you know, crew salaries, everything across the board comes into play. So whatever money you're making on the road and albums, it's a big word called recoup. <laughs> recoup is a huge word that you have to pay back all that money that you recorded with. All that stuff, it, it goes go back, it goes right back to them, and that's your money, man. That's your money. So you gotta be careful. You learn later on how to spend your money. So yeah, I would come home from tour and not have any any money in the bank, and I go back to my Uncle Joe's like the second record, spreading the disease, dude. Another another, another yeah, really wonderful uh, choice and uh, shorts there. I love it. But, I, but that's about that that era, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even, it was even a little before this. Right. Well, the, I'm just starting to make a salary on this 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 thing. Yeah. But, um, again, I look. I don't. I never forgot where I came from. So going back to my uncle Joe's deli was a pleasure because it got me back to reality. It, <laughs> it, it sounds like it was a great gig, man. It was a great gig because I hung out with my friends really, and I learned about life. And let's face it, there were girls that came in the store that um, had, we had some fun with. You know, I, I dated. I dated along. I learned. I learned my life lessons with some of those wonderful women. 
um, I just thought it was a great time. It was I, I learned about life in that store, honestly. So I looked at it as a, another training, um, you know, training place. Absolutely. Um, you know, when I was when I was doing my homework uh, for the show, I was listening. You know, Scotty was on the show recently, so I listened to. I, I got I got my anthrax fill in, yeah. and when when I was doing homework for this show. I came across Altitudes and Attitude, yeah. which, is, which is the stuff that you did um, uh, with uh, with Dave Ellison. Mm -hmm. And man, I loved it, bro. Dude, I mean, I, I actually, I actually listened to it and then let it go back to the top and listen to it again. And I really, really enjoyed it, man. Is nice, that dude. that's you playing guitar and singing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really good, man. I, 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 I really, I really enjoyed it. Um, it, it was a great time. A few, like two or three years back, Dave and I, we we had we were doing a bunch of bass clinics. Yeah. Um, and Dave and, I, and we would get together at the end of the bass clinics. We do joint bass clinics at the end of the both of ours. We had two different segments. And so Dave, after one at one of these bass clinics, he said to me, "Why don't we write some songs together so we could do it at these bass clinics?" I had a bunch of songs. He had some songs, and it became Altitudes and Attitude. And um, it thankfully it it did pretty well we were pretty satisfied with what we got out of it uh went on slow uh, went on tour with slash out in europe it was we did a run here in the states um it was a lot of fun uh but then our our main gigs came up again we had to put everything behind it and that, that's what happens um but it was it was just a, an, an out an outlet for me from anthrax i can the singer songwriter vibe you know that whole thing i can get in front of mike uh i still enjoy it was great it. man it, it was really good it 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 I don't know if I'm if I'm if I'm um, spot on because I don't listen to much of the Foo Fighters, mm -hmm. but it sort of reminded me a little bit of that sort of yeah. uh, that well, sort of. Say, that's a compliment. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Thank you, yeah. bro. I appreciate it. it. Was it's fun, and you know what? Um, I'm even writing now because this whole book brought up a whole bunch of shit in my head. So going through the history, and you know, I went through. So it, I'm I'm writing some solo songs. I just recorded a few more. So I'll probably put out, it'd be like a continuation of A&A, just probably with my name, you know, being a solo I thing. See. So Darren asks, if the, is there going to be another uh, Altitudes and Attitudes album in the near future? Not in the near future. I'll probably put out this stuff first somewhere. But if you like Altitudes and Attitude, I have to be really honest, the people that have heard it, they said they said it sounds like the continuation of Altitudes and Attitude, which I'm very happy with. And Dave's doing, Dave, Dave is my friend, just so you guys know. I love David. I just talked to him two days ago, texting him back and forth. Um, he's got another band called Lucid that I want to give That's a shout right. out. To. I think it's That's a good right. record. I hope he does well with it. So I'm pushing for him and uh, and moving on with life. And he's coming. He's coming on the show. He's and a great uh, interview too. Dave's yeah. he's, he speaks a lot better than I do. He's um <laughs> he's, he's I'm just, looking for I'm looking forward to having him on. He's a good dude, very knowledgeable, and uh, he's my friend, and and I love him. Yeah. Um, we're skipping. We're, let me see. We're skipping around here a little bit. Yeah, I want to yeah. make sure. Oh, you know what? I wanted to ask you about. Uh, comes up yeah. in the book for a second. Um, you mentioned in 1983, um, you went down to CBGBs uh, with Scott Ian. Uh, yeah. Saw a couple of hardcore matinees. Any memories from sort of any anything that that still resonates from you know when you went down there? Anything you Absolutely. remember? I loved it because look, I'm a New Yorker. Come from the Bronx, Scott and I, and sometimes Charlie too, come down to the, the matinees on Sunday. Just right. about what time is it now? Just isn't it four twenty? It's four thirty here. Right around right. this time, we would be down there, and it would right. be great. It would be a great vibe. You get to see these great. It was so much energy, and I yeah. learned. I learned. I watched, and I wanted to learn how it was done the right way. And it was the energy and and the passion. Uh, I'll never forget that. And plus the let's face it, the, the great vibe there was outside of the, when you hung out outside too. I do, I just I loved it. So we we go there quite a lot, quite a lot actually in those days. Yeah, I mean that's what we're sort of recreating now with, with those shows I just announced. We're doing that's great. shows a block away, right next to where. Remember Great Gildersleeves? Of course, man. Oh my god! Right next to where Great Gildersleeves was, Jesse Mellon has a place called the Bowery Electric, and 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 we're doing free with uh, uh, under the guise of Sunday matinees are back on the Bowery. Dude, and, uh, we're that's doing great. free. We're doing free shows on the Bowery. And uh, it's great. I think, you know, especially this generation, if they can get a taste of that, please, please keep that going, Drew, because I think it's really important for the music 
just in music in general, it's so important to have that. If you could bring that back, that's awesome, dude. Good, good for you guys. I love that. Yeah, you, you know, you know, something, something else very interesting that I read in the book uh, that I did not know, which I could relate to, being that um, you know I did a lot of acting as a kid uh, mm -hmm. and and as a teenager, and, and I went to Emerson College to study acting. Is uh, you studied acting with Bill Esper, right? Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. I loved it. You know, and then, again, I don't wear it on my sleeve because I'm not in it for the fame game as you, you know, we're not into that thing. I, I'm, I love, and to be honest, after getting to this age, I think, and finding out why I did different parts of my life, the reason why I got so deep into acting and studying, and it wasn't to be a movie star or any bullshit like that. I love theater. I love live in the moment kind of vibe, Be you know, falling off. The edge. If you fall off the edge, you got to fucking get back up again. It taught me about life. It taught me about me. Um, talk, it taught me about who I am uh, as a person. And um, for Bill Esper, I love that man. Rest his soul. He was just an incredible teacher. Um, he took me in. He knew I was in a band. You know, you know this distraction of being in a, in a metal band. You know, sure. I had to go away. He let me come and go. When I wanted, when I wanted to, he goes, "All right, so you'll do the two-year program. You can come in, but if you have to leave for tour, okay, you'll make it up." He was very. Now, very good. now that was the Meisner technique, correct? Yeah, yeah. I studied. I, you know, I studied also with another. I don't know if you know another acting teacher. She was great, Marilyn Freed. She was I the other side. She, yeah, she was. Um, was that the other technique? The other technique, Strasberg. So, so for me. That's the one I. That's the one I studied under. Yeah, I wanted to learn both. I think it's important to have you know, a, a, you know, both sides of it, and and come up with my own. So, and I did, and I I I enjoy it, but it's not for the those those fame reasons. I I think I know myself better because of that. I do. Uh, it made me. I mean, you know, you studied, so you understand. I love acting, man. That that was my dream as a kid. That's what I always wanted to do. Um, I wanted to be an actor. My dad was a film director. I saw him work I with that. actors. I wanted to be an actor. I went to Emerson College to study acting, and I went to my first hardcore show. Yeah. And it just sort of, woo. That's You see, this is where we're, we're together on this, Drew. See, that's my problem with it. My first music, music will always be my first love, but this acting was really, it was really right there. It was, yeah. and, and again, it's just for standing on that rope, man, and yeah, the moment thing, moment to moment thing, and all that shit. And if you could fall off, I want, I want to live on that. The stage, yeah. the stage is just. I don't know what's gonna happen, but I want to live like life is this fucking short. I want to live in that thing, right? Go take, go, yeah, go take an improv class, bro. <laughs> I have. Yeah, I have, I, I have, dude. Yeah, and that's I mean, that improv and comedy, man. I, I, I took an, an improv class. I loved it. Then it's just, th just you're just throwing yourself dude. into the breach, man. Yeah. It's. And the, and the different scenarios. I love the different scenarios. You come up with it on the, on the, and just go with it. Nothing's wrong, right? Yeah. There's no there's no wrong answers. You just keep going with it. It's like a yep. run on sentence. I love that. And and you actually played Richard Hell in the movie yeah. uh, Greetings from Tim Buckley. Yeah, you man. played you know you know legendary you know punk you know Lower East Side guy Richard Hell. Yeah. Did you? I mean, did you know who Richard Hell was before you auditioned for the role? I knew who he, I knew who he was. I didn't. I mean, know. I mean, I mean like right, like sort vague. of peripherally. Being really honest, it was very vague. My my agent gave me this audition, right? I, right. I, I, okay, so I, I usually look into the if it's a person, I look into them and all that stuff. Of course. Vaguely, I had an idea coming in, but then when it started getting serious and the callbacks started coming, you know, the callbacks for the show for the film, and they were interested. Then you start digging in, right? Because then you know it's worth it. You might have a shot at this thing. And then I really started getting into it. And um, I, I found it, dude, I, I'll tell you right now, um, I learned a whole lot. But here's the truth. I was really scared. I was really scared that I didn't want to fuck it up, you know? Yeah. And this way, this, you go too deep, you fuck up. You go too light, you fuck up. Where's yeah. the happiness right there? So Dan Algrant, the, the director, really helped me with this. And he told me the place to be at. He was really, he was happy where I was, what I came in with, with, with whatever I brought in. He says, that's where I want you to stay. You don't have to go further. Don't go back. Just stay there and let it, let it grow. And I loved it. And Ben, uh, Ben Lejeune says, I remember Frank in the intro of a Law and Order episode. <laughs> yeah. Um, right? I, the casting director, her name is Suzanne Ryan. I, I know her for a long time. I've read for her a million times. She's always like me and we've always had great readings, thankfully. She's always wanted to have me in, but every time I'm 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 up for a part or, or or close to a part, Anthrax has another tour, 
So it's always been like, boom, boom, pull me out. <laughs> it's one of those things. You, it's feast of famine. But uh, yeah. this this one opening slide, I think, I don't know how many lines, or 10 lines, whatever it was for this opening thing. And uh, it was it was fun. She got me in on it. Uh, she, she cast me and all that stuff. It was fun. Uh, and look, I'm a diehard Law & Order fan uh, yeah. you know, uh, from, forever. So it was a big deal to me. I want to talk about, um, man, I saw this picture, man. It just put a big smile on my face, bro. Because I first I looked at it and I was like, okay, he's playing a show. Then I noticed then I noticed where it was. That's this, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, wow, we've arrived, man. Yeah. It's like you guys playing Yankee Stadium. I mean, that must have been absolutely incredible. Tell us about it. Well, as I stare at this picture, I'm still, I freak out. And, you know, this was one of those days. And I'm freaking out for you, bro. Yeah, yeah and wow. I thank you. Because I, I bring everybody with me here because it's not just me. It's an experience of all my family, everybody, my grandmother. And I, I'll let you guys know, it's in the book. This is the last show my grandmother, who I grew up with, we were talking about before, Charlie's mom. This was the last show that she got to see us. But she was the one that made it possible for Charlie and I to get here. So right. it was very important for me to make sure she knew. And we said, thank you. I saw her in the parking lot after the show and said, thank you. You know, because without her, we don't play Yankee Stadium in our lifetime. No, I mean, look, guys from the Bronx and Queens, you don't get to play Yankee Stadium. That's this doesn't happen. And then a thrash band, come on. So we were very fortunate. Dude, it was the highlight of my life. We thought Headline in the Garden at the time we did was, um, was amazing. We thought that'd be, the, that'd be the thing. But this big four thing, Metallica and I tip my hat to them to this day, yeah, um, because they, they could play these places on their own, uh, and they took us along for this this ride on this big four thing. And I'm very I'm very I'm just thankful that they they were big enough of a band. They were and people they were they're, they're good people to do this. They didn't have to do this. They brought this as a celebration for this music. And uh, yeah, so and when you when you say Frank Bello, who's a diehard Yankee fan. Grew up 10 minutes from the stadium, always there, always there. Yeah, yeah. Um, played Yankee Stadium. You didn't see that happening, but, you know, it's a feather in your cap, right? Yeah, I love I love this shot. You know, looking at this shot, I, I recognize everybody. Is that uh, on, on the left there? That That's uh, Paul Bostoff? No, because Dave Lombardo. That's Dave Lombardo, oh, right? Dave, um, Dave Lombardo. Dave Lombardo, the only, yeah. The only person I don't recognize is the guy to your right behind behind Hetfield? Is that the drummer for Megadeth? Yes, that's Sean. Right. That's Sean, right. the drummer for Megadeth. Sean right. Drover, right? Yeah. And there's a, there's a bunch of shots like these going around, but I um I remember this one. This is I'm fond of this shot because that's a great shot. This it's was great. this was the beginning of something really fun and special that will. I don't, and there's I, Hanneman. Hanneman was still. And there. Hanneman, Jeff's there. Come on, our oh boy. So and uh, it's a very guess, special. Caggiano was playing with you guys, Caggiano, right? Caggiano, of course, Rob. Look, that's a different hat he's wearing that day, which is nice. Yeah, that's just what your band needs, more Italian dudes, right? <laughs> right? Let's get another Italian guy in the band. I was just talking with Caggiano the other day, busting his balls, not stuff. He has, he's got this new hat. Did you see the new white hat he's got? No. He's got this, like, a, it's like a fedora. It's like, it looks like he's making cigars. It's uh, it's awesome. It looks like he he's, he's having a, co it looks like he has a cocktail in his hand. It's, it's hilarious, but it's so Rob. I love it. He's a very talented guy. It's, I mean, he's awesome. He's, he's a awesome. very, I got to say, he's a very talented guy uh, as a producer, as a musician. Yes. And, and uh, you know, I like the band a lot that he's in now. Me too. I'm good friends with them too. So uh, yeah. they're, they're all great guys. I love them. Rob's a talented, talented dude. I love him. Great guitar player. Great ear. Rob's got a great ear. And he's also yeah. one of the best people to hang out with. He's just a right. lot of fun all the time. Um, he's got his repertoire of girls around the world. As you know, as, <laughs> as you know, my friend. Yes. So it's funny to see what shows up. Um, is this the move? Is this like the? Is this is this the patented I move? I see this. Is it? Is this? Is this the 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 Frankie Bello move? You know, it's weird. I don't even remember doing this. I don't. I don't do this now. And I and my friend Andrew Buchanan, who took these photos, um, great photos. I saw a lot of them. Um, I don't remember doing this, but he captured this. I think this is just a celebration of the show, having having a great show and just bringing it all the way up and saying, thank you. Um, that's not one of my signature moves, you know what I mean? Like, oh, at the end of the show. <laughs> because at, at the end of the show, I'm usually too tired to hold that fucking bass up like that. 
Okay, here's here here I got here's a good one here. Let's talk about this dude a little bit, and I just want to read something, a couple notes that 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 I that I took um, uh, from the book. Um, in the book, you talk about you guys were on tour, you were playing with Motorhead, yeah. and it was in the era when people were gobbing and spitting on people, you know, which yeah. which is just friggin' disgusting, yeah. you know. Yeah. And although in some bizarre way, it's um, it's a show of affection. Yeah. Um, what we heard back then, they were saying it was having a piece of them on you as a connection. Oh, God. It doesn't, it doesn't help when, you know, you smell, I, I say it in the book, when you go into bed and there's no showers after the show and you have to lay in your bunk and you're smelling the spit from that night's show oh. in your hair. Uh, it doesn't help that. But, um, yeah, it's pretty pretty gross. You know, Joe Strummer from The Clash got hepatitis because someone gobbled and it went right in his mouth. And he ended up getting sick and, and getting hepatitis. I read but, that. But but I love the bit that in the book where you say, yo, Lemmy wasn't having it. He said, one more time and we're done. Yep. And if someone did it, they'd walk the fuck off the stage. I love it. He kept his word and absolutely did that. And you know what? I love it. Good, good on him. You know, I love I love that because it's unacceptable. For me, we, and that, that was a time and a place, right? The people did that. And uh, I, right now, it's a different game. You know, I, that's just totally dangerous and I want nothing to do with spitting really yeah uh, yeah absolutely um any any uh, motorhead memories you guys played with them a lot yeah I have one in the book and I'm not trying to there's so many stories in the book I don't have, I don't have to worry about giving them away but this one that always stands in my in my uh, my memory that was one of my special times with Lemmy because we toured so much with with motorhead and they were so great to us they they was they were yeah, always wow. beautiful people great well, obviously great band um one of these tours we did, uh, I would just stand next to the monitor board, you know, on the side uh -huh. and just watch their sound checks every day. I wanted to see how it worked, how I wanted, because I'm a bass fan. I'm, I, I want, I'm a student. I want to learn things from the greats. Lemmy is one of the greats. I wanted to see how he adjusted, if he adjusted, how he picked. You know, he had a specific way of picking that was incredible that I wanted to learn. Every little thing, every little nuance that he had, I wanted to learn. So I would watch every day and watch it couldn't have been six to seven feet from the monitor board to the stage where I was watching Lemmy at the, at the mic playing. So uh, I'm watching them. I'm, I'm, I'm literally head back. I'm getting into it. Right? I'm like this. So they break. They take a break. And he goes, and he sees me over there. This is this is after numerous days of, of watching every day. He goes, come here. And he has his bass on. He goes, come here. I'm looking behind me. I'm saying, please don't let him be talking to me. He's talking to me. Yeah, come here. Come here. And so he, goes, he says it again. I go out there. So fucking nervous. Because it's Lemmy. I've met him a million times and he's great to me always. He goes like this, come here. Takes his bass off, dude, puts it on me. Go. Just like that, dude. And he goes, he wants me to play his rig. Lemmy. Who his rig. Oh. Who man. his rig. Which is candy store time, right? This I'm in a candy store now. This is one of the highlights of my life. Right? Yeah, but that rig, that <laughs> you know, you know where we're going. That that, that rig, man, that rig was you it will never walk the earth again. No. So I, I, I compare this in the book. I compare it to that, that Michael J. Fox. Uh, what is the name of the movie? Um, Back to the Future. Back to the no, Future. No. Or, or, yeah, Back to the Future. Back to the Future. In the beginning yeah. scene, where he has that big speaker and he turns the cord on. He turns the guitar on and he gets blown away. That happened to me. So Lemmy goes, come here. And he turns his, he tells his, he tells his tech, turn it up. It was fucking loud as it was. It was on 10 as it was. I didn't know he had more to go. He turns it up. <laughs> dude. So I go up. He goes, I take a couple of steps up to the amp, dude. He goes, play. I play, dude. It was that moment. Like, my, <laughs> I got blown back. I took through two or three steps. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> oh, boy, I hit an E chord. <laughs> and he fucking, he, and you, see, <laughs> you hear him like a smirk, like that pirate smirk, that, like, that laugh. It was fucking awesome because he knew, he knew that was going to happen. That was one of the highlights. So right after, he's laughing. Uh, he's laughing about watching me go through this. And he goes, come here. He goes, Takes, his head, takes a pick out of his pocket. He goes, this is the one I play with. Those I just go out. He gave. I still have that pick to this day. Wow. It is that special to me. That memory, it's in the book, but it's that special to me because you don't get these opportunities unless you're in, in that zone. And I was very lucky to be in that zone, you know? I just remember, see, I, I remember seeing him and, and he, they'd come out and he'd walk up to the mic, real matter of fact, and go, we are Motorhead. We are rock and roll and they would just crush it i, I that always yeah. stuck with me we're motorhead we are rock and roll 
absolutely. And they were, wow. they were motorhead, man. And that's, yeah, there will only be one motorhead, right? In our lifetimes. And I'm glad, I'm glad I was part of it. It was, it was, it was special, very special. Yeah, I got to see them play a couple times up close uh, on stage. I watched them once. I, I mentioned this on the show before. I watched them once sitting right behind Mickey D and it was just like, wow. He's awesome. That, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Mickey D's a great drummer. I mean, he is. He, he plays with the Scorpions now. He's, he's awesome. Yeah. He's a great dude. Yeah. He's a friend. He's a good person. Hey, um, let's, let me take my final sponsor break. Let's come back and we'll take questions from around the world. Go for it, dude. Well, there you have it. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Our guest today is Frankie Bello. We're talking about his new book. Um, we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, Generation Records, and Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, located in Lakewood, Colorado, is the Rocky Mountain headquarters for all things punk, hardcore, and metal. Established in 2014, they have the largest selection of records, CDs, shirts, stickers, patches, and accessories between Chicago and Los Angeles. From the pit to the ditch, they got your back. Get in touch with them at www.chainreactionrecords.com. Also, come on now up at Dobbs Ferry, Debo, and Lee Fairley. This is New York Hardcore Comics, opened in 2013, selling comic books, punk rock, and hardcore memorabilia, toys, statues, skateboard decks, vinyl, and all things horror. We, help, we love helping bands push their demos or new tracks, so please stop by and drop off your new music. We have in-store events like Magic, The Gathering, and Warhammer tournaments plus meet and greets with bands and some live performances. Open seven days a week and shipping worldwide. Find us online through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and eBay, located at 117 Main Street in lovely Dobbs Ferry, New York, www.newyorkhardcorecomics.com. DTFM Vinyl Distro is a record store that specializes in underground music, punk, ska, hardcore metal, and more. Located in the heart of Fargo, North Dakota's Industrial District, shop in person or online at www.dtfmvinyldistro.com, where the motto is, death to false metal. Come on now, Lower East Side represent. What's up, Vlad? I know you're listening right now. Can't wait to get down there and eat some organic grill. It's a vegan restaurant located in the East Village of New York City at 123 First Avenue, featured in New York Magazine, New York Times, and, believe it or not, incredibly, Veg News. The dishes have won numerous awards, including Best Veggie Burger. They make their own cheeses, sausages, and burger patties, and every dish on the menu can be made gluten-free. Goddamn electric. This year, they're celebrating their 21st anniversary, and they're all about having a great time while enjoying amazing clean food. This food is amazing, and it's clean. They have now fully reopened for business and look forward to seeing you. Get in touch with them and order some great food at www. TheOrganicGrill.com. Last but not least, since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as T-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area, that being New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com or follow them on Facebook or on Instagram. I want to mention a couple of things. Um, once again, thanks to all the Facebook pages that support me. Let me post um, about the show. I appreciate it. We appreciate it. There is a merch line underneath there. Feel free to buy a piece of merch. A piece of merch. Maybe you want the mug. Maybe you want the shower curtain or the do good things will come to you uh, shirt. Uh, there is a super chat. It is question time. If you got a burning desire of a question, spend a few bucks, make it a super chat. I'll see it in color. I can't miss it. It'll go right to the front of the line. Any questions for Frank Bello, please feel free to do a super chat. It's a great way to support the show. Uh, I want to thank a couple of my new patrons, my patrons on Patreon. Um, if you're not a patron, you should be a patron. You get this book for free. You get a lot of other cool stuff that's going on. I want to thank Mike LaRouche, Jimmy Koskis, and Michael Gibbons from Leeway, who's been a patron for a while. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, Gibbons. Um, that said, do I have everything else? 
Um, follow me on Instagram. There's the Instagram address. IG on Instagram at Stone Films NYC. There it is. Pick up your communication device and get on Instagram. You know, you know, you love Instagram. It's where all the cool kids are going these days. <laughs> God, what does this world come to? You know. Um, so yeah, start posting up your picture. Your, your, excuse me. Start posting up your questions for our guest Frank Bello. I think I covered everything. What's in the private chat? Um, yeah, um, everybody behaving themselves seems that way. It's been a great show. I had a good, told you I had a good feeling about this. Um, let me just make sure, uh, I just want to mention who is up next, uh, before we bring Frankie back coming up next, October 24th. I'm actually going to Florida on Monday, tomorrow. Bringing my girlfriend, the rock chick, to meet my dad should be interesting. Wish me luck. Um, Sunday, October 24th, Richie Crutch is coming on the show. That's the next show one week from today. There is no show this Wednesday. I will be down in Florida with the rock chick and my dad. So that said, um, let's bring our guests back. Let's chop it up. Hold on. Let me clear the deck. Also, any every a couple of people asking about the book. Let me post the book thing one more time. Um, but buy the freaking book, you bum. www.stonefilmsnyc.com. It's twenty four ninety five. All right, take your yarmulke off and buy the book. It ships November first. All right. Uh, that said, here we go. Yeah, the book is shipping to Europe. What do you think? What do you think? I'm making a book and we're not shipping more. More. More of you freaking clowns in Europe buy this book than. These knuckleheads in the States. Uh, by the way, Cortex, Cortex has uh, is selling the book. If you don't want to buy it from me, that's okay. Uh, the the, the pre-sale, uh, Cortex is selling the book. So all you European people, buy it from Cortex. Support, support Cortex and also buy the antidote NYHC 7-inch that just came out today. So yeah, the ship, you, you can buy it. Um, from Cortex, let me or, or buy it from me. It, it costs as much to ship the book over there as to buy it. So buy it from Cortex. Help me help you. All right. Help me help you. Let me clear the deck. Let's bring our guests back on. Get 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 your get your yeah, get your questions. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, help man. me help you. <laughs> help me help you, man. Buy the goddamn book. Uh, from in Europe, save yourself. Save yourself the cost. It's so true. The shipping and everything else, it's more than the book at this point, really. It's, it's criminal, bro. It's insane. It's insane. It, 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 it's freaking criminal. Um, <laughs> let me get rid of uh, this other banner. Uh, yeah. Let's see what we got. Um, all right. Let the games begin. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Yeah. Cortex Germany. What do you think? What do you think? Cortex Mars? Is there another in Cortex Germany in Berlin, for Christ's sake? What do you want me to do? Smoke it for you, too? Unbelievable. <laughs> um, here you go. Uh, 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 hold on. <coughs> oh, here's a good one. Let's start with this. Bob King, what does Frank consider to be his greatest musical achievement? Oh, man. That's a tough one. I know, bro. Musical, look, to be honest, just to be, and it sounds... It sounds made up, but it's not. It, just being able to record a record, honestly, to be re like a professional musician, that's my, from making that jump from my bedroom in the Bronx, my bedroom in the Bronx to get it to a recording studio, to a, a record, that was my biggest thing. And you can, the accolades, the gold records, all that stuff is great. And I'm very, I'm, I'm humbled with, with all that stuff, but getting to that, that spot, where you can actually be a recording musician and then a live musician, learning how to play live is a different animal. Yeah. Uh, so that that's what I, as, as, as an achievement, um, I'm very proud of that. Good. Uh, let's bring, I think, Rap Bones. Rap Bones. Hey, come on. Rap Bones, you got something for Frankie? Yo, man. Yo, I'm jumping <laughs> at the bit over here. Let's go. I know you. I see you oh, backstage me... freaking out. What do you got? 
I don't want to show toys and collectibles, but since I did hit the flea market this morning and I bought a huge pile of Metal Maniacs <laughs> from the late 80s and 90s, uh -oh. I just really? want to give Charlie a This Is Your Life moment. You know, I've been a fan since. Oh, dude. My God. Just full of metal days. Wow. Awesome. And for the Megaforce Records in the, in the hit parade with the ACD on the cover, yeah, right? Man. And then I found this one. I'm just going to go through these three really quick. I thought this was really cool. This is a, a metal edge. Is it, is it cringeworthy? No, it's all. Uh, this one is, I think you guys were making a statement here. You had just got John Bush in the band. Oh, yeah. And uh, you're saying we will not change our name in this party. Right. Oh, that, that, was, that was when the 9-11 thing happened. And there was New York Steel Show. Right, the yeah. New York Steel and Show. Then, I've been sitting here trying to, you know, have a little skit for you guys. You know, the bass player always gets the shaft, right? You made the center page on the interview, you know? Oh, look at that. That's you a rarity. Know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that was for uh, something they had at the Hammerstein Ballroom. On the metal edge. Now here's the kicker, and I got one question for you. Okay. But here was the other cool thing I found. I picked this up. Well, I bought this striper shirt at a different table, and then stripers on the cover of this. But I knew you were coming on the show, and it had anthrax on it too. Mm -hmm. So I grabbed this real quick with that pile. But the cool thing in here is uh, this flyer for the show you guys did at the oh, end. Oh wow! Uh, I remember that. That was oh, awesome. The metal church. Wow. Those I have that, wait a second. I have that somewhere. Hold yeah, on. Man. Let me find that. Hold on. Those are crazy shows. And then, uh, yeah, they got the interview with you guys in there and everything. The Anthrax, I guess when you switched over to Island Records, right? Yep. That was the hype then. Yep. Oh, and there was one more cool thing because in the pre, last thing I'm going to show you. And then I got Hold on. There it is right there. Bam. Wow, dude. You got to yeah. send me that picture, Drew. Yeah, I, listen, we, yo, the archive goes deep here, son. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. The last thing I got, the last yeah. thing I got, because I heard you saying what happened to all these clubs, here's an ad for the Cat Club in New York. Oh, wow. Man. Super Dude. cool, man. You wow. Know, down memory lane stuff. That is memory lane. That's great stuff. I wish people, the younger generation, could see that a little bit and see what kind of, get that vibe of what, what was around. Oh, man. Sure. Good, well, we, were, we were very hungry, you know, like uh, yeah. I remember one show. I don't know if Michael Graves just came back to the Misfits, but it was in Jersey. It was the 80s, late 80s. Mm -hmm. Anthrax with the Misfits. Oh, yeah, it was we awesome. We did in because it was like some disco tech place. They didn't want us in. And my memory is I bought the Misfits patch with the green around it. It was a real big one for three bucks. You know, that's all it took. That was yeah. the night for me. It was, so, it was great. If that whole you total break awesome. here in your uh, your tale of your life, you know, I, I go have some of the same things. Like, what makes us men runs deep within us, you know. That's for yeah. no one to judge us, but we know why we wind up being the good guys in life, you know. Yeah, so exactly. I have a question for you, and then we'll let the, the, everyone get at you. I love that you were all married with children. That's one of my <laughs> out of music memories of Anthrax that I thought was incredibly great. But my yeah. even better moment is you did the same thing when you w did a cont contest on MTV and you literally went to someone's house and you guys were like sawing the side of the house with the double man yeah. saw. What? Was that dude. you doing? Were you on what? one side of that saw? Yeah, dude, We they gave us, yeah, they gave us hey. free reign to do whatever we wanted. I and then we did. That. Was that a setup house or did you really mess up their we house? Said, do whatever you want to do because they were re restructuring or whatever they were doing. Did we... We went to town on that thing, they, and we we asked we asked questions. Are we allowed to do this, this, this? Go for it. Okay, That's cameras on, all, cameras on, and uh, that was you know a lot of young energy there, and we, a good time. That was a good time. Okay. Like well, her, we lived back then, you know. Oh, good. Well done, Rat. Yes, Frank. Right, I'll talk, great I'll talk to you soon, stuff, man. Love Thanks, bro. Have you later, bro. Take care yourself. Later, later bro. Right. Yeah, there you go. That's cool. Um, this is an interesting one from our resident historian, Chucky Brown, says, during the ending of the South American tour with Iron Maiden while heading back to New York, Bruce Dickinson invited Frank to the cockpit. Can you speak on that? Yeah. Again, another highlight that I put in the book because I want people that don't know this story uh, to, to hear it. It's a, that's how great Bruce Dickinson is. And Iron Maiden in general, as not only the band, 
but the organization are just top notch and above top notch. They're that mm -hmm. they're that good, Iron Maiden, as people and as a, as an organization. We did this whole tour. We were fortunate enough to do with Iron Maiden Stadium tour in South America, Drew. It was incredible. Sold out every night. You know how big Iron Maiden is. Incredible. Well, Iron Maiden's big, but in South America, it's a whole nother level, man. New level, right? So, dude, yeah. so not only, of course, our manager brings it to us. Fuck yeah, we're in. You know, we're, we're doing the whole thing, right? And then he brings the second line up. Here's the kicker. Not only are we going to get to do the stadium tour with Iron Maiden in South America, we're also going to be able to go on Ed Force One, their plane. Their plane, they're inviting us on their plane, band and crew, gear and everything. And, Every this, dude, and this dude drives the plane? Bruce Dickinson, who is Why? a licensed the plane. Bruce Dickinson, who is a licensed pilot, was he did um, I don't know how many trips he did with us. Incredibly, incredibly flew us all around South America. Incredible. I mean, he had a co-pilot and stuff, but I saw him. He was at the he was at the range of the of the plane, man. So so, so so he go so he does the whole show, and then I mean do, I mean I would do you guys fly after the show? No, the no. What we did was usually you go back to the hotel and sleep. He needs a, like there's, there's a bunch of hours that he needs to have sleep, you know. I see. And, I see. And maybe a day off and sure, sure, fly. sure. We fly off. We fly on the days off. Capish, capish. It, it was all good and it was all safe. But I'll tell you, man, he did a great job and. There's nothing better. It felt like you're in a president, a president's plane, like a Air Force One, because we came into town. You have lines of people waiting outside the airport like crazy. Dude, security, security, like cops, like like president stuff. <laughs> they, they, they lined us. We got in, you know, passports. You know how we go through customs and stuff. Customs like, okay, just go. It was all that. We got escorted to with the police, with our main. We were allowed to go with them to the hotel. I mean, police escort. It was insane. It was insane. It was like being the president. I'll never forget it. So what he's talking about in this question, Chucky's talking about, um, on the way home, after that tour's finished, I'm the only New Yorker that's coming home. So wow. Charlie's going to Chicago. Scott's going to LA. Fortunately enough, Iron Maiden are flying into JFK. Dude, um, would you like to come? I couldn't say yes fast enough. It was, well, I couldn't even get the words. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I, I said it immediately. I'm in, I'm in. So they gracious enough to let me on the plane, business class seat. They give me right with them hanging out. Great. So long story short, um, I'm having a, a beverage of the, the Iron Maiden Trooper beverage. Um, and not only do they have their own plane, but they have their own beer too. Dude, you know, and I, a little quick tidbit for people to know on that tour, the first show of that tour was a really hot one, stadium show. Really sweaty, sweaty show, stadium show. So right after the show, we go drying off, fucking sweating our balls off. Who comes in, true story, who comes in with a big crate of ice-cold trooper beer? Steve Harris himself. Brings in this, you guys thirsty? Boom. That started everything, man. It was just like so right. That's how good these people are. So get back to my other story. So coming back. I'm on this flight coming home to JFK from South America. Get the flight attendant. I'm having my beer, my trooper beer. My flight attendant comes up and taps me on my shoulder. Um, Bruce would like Bruce is flying the plane. He's flying home. So taps me. Uh, Bruce would like to see you in the cockpit. I took a second. I'm good. I was so fucking freaked out, dude. I said, I, I just literally said, I'm good. I'll just sit here. I don't want to bother anybody. She goes, no. He wants you in the cockpit. She goes, no, he wants you in the cockpit. And I know I, I've never been in a cockpit. I'm a little afraid about the shit coming at you. You know, yeah, that's coming yeah, at you yeah. fast, right? I don't and, think I ever have. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to be responsible for, God forbid, anything happening that I'm in the cockpit. God forbid, you know. Dude's <laughs> bullshitting with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. God forbid anything happens. I don't need that fucking guilt. Frank Bellow killing iron. God, God forbid, right? I don't need that yeah. problem. I don't want to be a distraction. So she insisted. So I, I said, okay. So I go up the stairs. I go up the stairs reluctantly, climbing, and I see the other guys. Steve, hey, Steve, how you know? I'm saying, hi, Adrian, everybody, say hello to everybody. You know, talking. Uh, oh, he wants you in there. How do all? I said, oh, yeah, I'm a little nervous. He goes, Steve goes, just go in, open the door. Bruce is what this is. Bruce Dickinson in this seat, the big window that I was afraid of, the big window of the airplane that's flying. You see the fucking clouds coming at you, right? I'm nervous. Bruce Dickinson, another pilot right here, and another guy right here doing the, I don't know, weather. I don't know what he's doing. So long story short, Bruce has piles of papers looking for the correct route. 
They couldn't find the correct. I just happened to come in at the wrong time where they're they're finding the correct route. They were sent the wrong wrong route to get to JFK landing pattern. I didn't understand any of this shit. I was so all I saw was a bunch of papers and Bruce is looking up like this and the other pilots like this. I'm saying, who the fuck's flying the plane? Right? I'm like, I don't want to be, you know, I'm nervous. He goes, Bruce, he goes, Oh, figures, you come now. And I, I said, should I leave? He goes, no, 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 sit down. So he's looking, we're just trying to find the, the right flight pattern. So I sit down right behind him. They're like, you're there. I'm right behind Bruce Dickinson, watching him fly the plane, looking for a flight pattern. I'm scared. I'm going to shit in my pants. I don't belong there. I don't belong. So he goes, oh, don't worry. We're fine. Everything's good. So I, have you ever have you ever been there? I said, I've never been here and I can't wait to leave. I don't, I don't want to be here today, but I was so intimidated. So we, he showed me some of the buttons and the knobs and the, very smart dude. I have to tell you, man, my brain does not have that capacity for learning what he's learned. It's I mean, incredible. It's, it's pretty incredible, incredible that, 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 yeah, that, 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 that's, that's, that's incredible. It was that special. So I didn't overstay my, um, my, my welcome, but he goes, no, I said, look, I don't want to overstay my welcome, but this was the time where we're just about to come into JFK, dude. We're coming into J I'm a New Yorker coming in. I've never been in the cockpit coming in. He, la he lands the thing too. Coming in. Coming in, oh, I see. And what they, when the JFK people do that, they don't, for some reason, don't let anthrax do. <laughs> they have fire trucks coming up. They have fire trucks saluting Iron Maiden with water things. So the Ed Force One's pulling up to the gate, right? Great landing. Bruce does great landing. We're, we're going up to the gate. There's fire trucks doing this special thing for them. But Iron Maiden's coming in. It was this big to do. That's I'm, awesome, man. Anthrax doesn't get that. <laughs> we're not anthrax. We're not Maiden, of course, but yeah. it was so special, awesome. dude. That's great. Like I come back down, security dude. Uh, you've been to JFK security, obviously, dude. I walked through. I walked through. Show my passport like this. I just had to hold Especially it up. Especially on an international flight, right? No, no such thing as customs. I went right out. Incredible, but one of the highlights of my life. Yeah. Absolutely. Here's um, here, okay. Let's let's go here, man. Let's go here. Oliver Oliver says fondest memories of the John Bush era. Um. You know what my fondest? There's a lot of great ones because I, I consider Anthrax two bands that I was lucky yeah. enough to be part of. There was a, I, I, yeah, I get that. You know, it, it's the only way I, I, I make sense of it because it was two really great times in my life. Sure. Belladonna, Belladonna version and John Bush. And now we're back to the Belladonna version. Yeah. I had great times. The greatest thing about hanging out with John is hanging out with John Bush, sitting at a bar, talking, just talking about life. He's one of the most down to earth, good people. To hang, I don't know if, if anybody's ever had a chance to hang out with John Bush, do it. Have a beer with him. He's one of the most educated, smart people, just fun dude to hang out with. And we've had great shows, obviously. There's been so many. Look, we did that whole Pantera tour on, with John Bush. Yeah. And talk about drinking. Um, insanity. Insanity on that tour. So those, those were some of the highlights. Um, just, just being with John was a lot of fun. So that whole time was a great time. Chris, Chris Tatro, small clubs versus stadiums. Uh, see, two different animals. You, you, the, with stadiums, you want the big aura. You know, you want that shit. You know, the the, the fact is, you, you see, that's great. And I'm look, thank God I, I was able to do that. And I'm, Man, well, that's that's big. That looks like what's that? The download? What is that? It's gigantic. That's man. one of the that's one of the festivals. It looks what, like one of the Humongo Fest. Yeah, one of the Humongo Festival. That's just it's infinite. You know, on that big four thing, dude. I remember some of the shows you couldn't see past the people because they just kept going like miles. Yeah, it, it just it was infinite. But um, uh, again, I feel very fortunate. But you know what you're missing there? You have that great energy and all that stuff of, of a big mass crowd. But look how far everybody is. I like when people are up and intimate too. You know what I mean? So we're, we're lucky enough to do both, but it's really hard. You know, you like getting back to like reacting with people right in their faces too. So I'm not going to say this isn't good. I love this, but both, I'm, we're fortunate enough to do both. So I say both. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, good one. Let me, uh, let's see what else we got here. Um, is this what's he talking about? Frank, do you remember the MTV Headbangers Ball when everyone piled up the chairs in the middle of the floor and danced around it? Exodus and Halloween were on the bill? Vaguely. I think I remember something. Yeah, I remember the, the pile up of chairs. I just don't remember the that was a thing for a minute, right? Like yeah. rip up chairs and throw chairs around. Yeah, that was I mean those those were good times. We everybody those those tours that Headbangers Ball tour was 
a ball, man. It was just good friends hanging out. That's what that was. Here's interesting. The first time I saw Anthrax was in December of 87 at the Capitol Theater in New Jersey. Uh, I love that place. It too. was Anthrax, Exodus, and Celtic Frost. Any memories of that tour? Yes, just another great Another great tour. We've been fortunate enough to have a lot of bands play with us that and, and play with bands that just were fans of. Now, you have Exodus and, and Celtic Frost. Some people say Celtic Frost. Some people say Celtic Frost. Um, right. We're fortunate enough. For me, just watching the bands play with us. I watch. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Yeah. So the greatest thing is about watching, like, think about that. You have Celtic Frost and then Exodus. You That's your that's your fill right there, man. Yeah. Think about that show. You have just and you get you pumped up for your next for our show right after that. So yeah, that that whole tour was awesome. This this photo here, um, let me clear this stuff out. Is you and Paige Hamilton? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, you know, interesting. Uh, you know, one thing that um, I learned. In um, a couple of things I learned from the book and, and, and doing some research on this one is that um, you did leave Anthrax for a little while and um, you played um, in Helmet with Paige for about a year. And um, you, yeah, that and um, what's the other thing that I got? Hold on. I took a note here. I got to <laughs> find this because it's, re it's, it's really interesting, I thought. Um, Oh, you did leave Antrax, and Joey Joey Vera from um, Ar Armored Saint took your place. So there was yeah. two Armored Saint guys in the band at that point, right? Yeah. yeah. And was... tell us about being in Helmet and, and what was that experience like? And we've had Paige on the show. We love that guy. Love Paige. Love Paige. One of my yeah. true friends in, in this life. But um, again, this is another time where it became apparent to – the, the guys, Scott, Charlie, me, we just needed a separation. It wasn't, I wasn't quitting. I wasn't, I wasn't thrown out. We just needed a separation for a little bit. We all knew it. It just, right. you, know, you come up to this point and you say, all right, we need, a, we need some space. I did it. I just took off for a while. Uh, they were going on. My friend, Joe, I'm, I'm, Joey's one of the, one of my better friends in life, Joey Vera. It was my pleasure to have him come in and take, take my place. Sure. And I know he would do it right. And I know it was going to be good for the band. Uh, me, I didn't know what I was doing when I when I did that. John Tempesta, you know John Tempesta, of course, of course, Johnny. I grew up with Johnny in high school. So yeah, Johnny, that's right. In the in the book, you talk about like, like you, you you he was like one of your childhood friends, him and his brother. Yeah, we, we and Mike Tempesta. I'm still still. So that must have been cool. That must have been cool. You joined Helmet and your and your buddy, your old buddy, was in there. That must have been great. He's the one that called me to come in because he found out I was I was. Uh, I wasn't with Anthrax, and he says, "What are you doing?" Dude, this is two weeks after I made the decision. He calls me up. What are you doing? And he goes, "I said I'm just chilling. I just want to get my head together." He goes, "Come out and jam with us." They're looking for a bass player. I said, "Dude, I don't know. It's it's weird." I, he goes, "It it makes total sense, dude. I'm a, I was a diehard Helmet fan. I mean, I like right. that stuff a lot." So long story short, uh, it all made sense. I went out there. Paige made me, dude, he said, learn a bunch of songs. I didn't know it was going to be 37 songs. He made me like learn like 37 songs to jam with them. And it worked. It just really, it was an easy vibe. Chris Trainer, the guitar player, was awesome. I think he plays with Bush yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Love him. Um, just a great, great band to be part of. Just very tight, very organized, very intricate. And um, I, I loved it. We did, we did a lot of touring for that. I didn't play on the record for Size Matters, but we did uh, – we did a full tour of that, and it was a lot of fun. We had a good, good time. A lot of, a lot of drinking. A lot of great. We did a snow core tour. Remember that? It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I remember that snow core. Yeah, it was fun. It was, and those, those that audience was very receptive, and I was very happy. A lot of Anthrax people came out to that too, which was nice. And also, I learned that uh, Matt Fallon, uh, before Joey joined, yeah. Matt Fallon sang for the band. Yeah, and, and you you did shows with him and everything, huh? I think I think there were a few shows. I don't know how many shows we did, but it wasn't that it just wasn't working. And to yeah, be, yeah, I got that. But no, no disrespect to anybody. It just it, either it works or it doesn't. It just was it wasn't the right fit. You know. Also interesting that he went on to be the original singer in Skid Row for a minute. Before. Yeah, I think that was beforehand. I, I don't was it before or after? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It was that. after, but yeah, maybe maybe. Yeah, but he's a nice guy, nice dude. Uh, any memories of the early days of hip hop growing up in the Bronx? Yeah, I mean the the early days. If you if you think about it, I mean that was another street thing, right? It was coming up. You felt that groundswell again. 
See, I mean, remember, I mean, for me, Run DMC, right? And the Beastie Boys, all the good stuff that, that was coming up. It was very street. It was, and I have to say this, it was heavy. It yeah. was, you know what I mean? It, it yeah. was something, there was substance, it was heaviness to the to the rhymes, to to the way they approached it, to the, to the things they were talking about. It was all heavy. So for me, it made complete sense. Yeah, that's, it, it's, it's very street. Well, also you went to Lehman High School, right? Yeah. I went to Kennedy High School in yeah. the Bronx, right? So, and, I, and I've mentioned this a couple of times. At this at the time you and I were going to high school in the Bronx, this stuff was bubbling, was bubbling up. And you would you would go to school and you'd hear it. And it was like it, there was a time, and this was a little bit later, then you know, a lot of this stuff was all running neck and neck, these underground like uh, culture movements, like graffiti, hip hop, hardcore, like they were all very underground. Now, of course. You know, people reference, oh, hip hop, it, it, it's it's a huge thing. But there was a time when New York hardcore was bigger than hip hop. You yeah. Know? But that's all, you know, and you talk about this, and this is a great conversation to have. That was the flavor of New York. All these yeah. beautiful things that are underground, right? There yeah. were all little spices that made it be the great place that it is, right? Yeah. And I miss that. I do yeah, miss yeah. that because there was a groundswell of all this, this great stuff coming up hip hop, hard, everything coming up. It was great. And, you know, it was a very special time. It really was. Chucky Brown says Lehman High School in the Bronx would always do Battle of the Bands in the 80s and 90s. That I was, that I was never part of. I could never. Well, for me, for, for me, I had my own little crew that I hung out with. They were all metal kids, you know, metal right. kids. And then we used to go to jazz class. Johnny Tempesta was one right. of them. We right. used to go to jazz class and we would we would go in there before the class started in jazz class and get the, I, I, the electric amp. There's only one amp. So I would turn it up to 10 with the bass. Johnny would get on the drums and we start ma Black Sabbath, Maiden, Priest, whatever. We were, we were jamming stuff. And then yeah. the teacher would come in and get us thrown out because she didn't want us abusing her instruments. That, that, that's great. Uh, uh, just checking in on the Chronicles. And I have to admit, I hardly heard any Anthrax song in my life. But Mr. Bello is a great and enthusiastic storyteller. Thank Kind you. regards, Daniel from The Hague. Thank you, Daniel. Yes. Very Thank much, you, bro. Daniel. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. That's very, very kind of you. That is kind. Um, yeah. Um, I first, I first, oh, you know what? Speaking, wait, actually, before we get to this, mm. you know, <clears throat> I tried out for Anthrax. Get the fuck, when? When you guys did that, that publicity stunt thing where like everybody, uh, that, that, whole, thing? that, that thing. Yeah. I, I tried out for Anthrax that day. The crazy thing about that, Drew, is we had, we had nothing to do with that. They I did, know. I know. That's the wrong. That wasn't the band doing it. Somebody actually put that together, and we, we said, "What?" We, I, and we had no idea about it. Well, it was John? It was Johnny Z, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, we we found out later. I was like, "We," but we had nothing. To, it's like you want to do it? That's fine. That we, we found out about it. For me, I found out about it later. I was like, "Really? How did it go?" <laughs> yeah, it was kind of it was kind of a bad look because he was there. I remember him being there, and and it was a bit of a circus. And and it's sort of you know sort of after the fact, it was very obvious that you guys were in line with John Bush already. So right. it's kind of like, that was kind of messed up. What, sort of. Where was that? Where was that though? It was in a club um, in the city. I don't remember the, it wasn't the cat club. It was some club in the city and it was like a cattle call and people kept going up and uh, doing, I think, got got the time. Is that wow. the, yeah. Do, 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 do. Right, <laughs> right. And and they were, you know, it was like they'd ring the bell. Next, no, do, next. And like right. it was one after the other after the other, and yo, some people, yo, some people were hilarious, bro. Like some people, like showed up, like you know, in the Santa Claus suit or whatever, and like <laughs> yo, some girl. Yeah, yeah, I remember there was like one girl that was awesome. You know, yo, I got up there for like you know a, a minute before that, like they hit the gong. You know, they just there was a gong. There was a gong. It was like a bell or a gong or something, you know. Oh, so it was involved. Oh my! I had, dude. Just so you know, as we speak, I didn't, I know I heard about this, but yeah. never got involved. Wow. No, no, I know, I know that you guys weren't involved. And, that's crazy. And, uh, but that's an interesting. And and Billy Milano claims that he has all the tapes. He goes, I have that tape of you trying out for, you know, don't fuck with me or I'll I'll put it make it <laughs> I'll put it on the internet, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's funny. Uh, Rob King says, I first saw Anthrax play at the Hammerstein Odeon in 89 with Living Color. Yeah. Their Bermuda Shorts era. Yeah. Cool. It was good times. Yeah. 
Is that right? Was Antrax on the Dr. Ruth show? We, uh, I don't know if a couple of us were, but this was the whole band. I remember, I think I was on it, yeah. <laughs> she's about 3'11". Like she's like three yeah. foot, four foot tall. She was really sweet though, really sweet. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I met her in, in person a couple is she, of times. Is she alive? I don't even know. I hope she is. Yes, yes she is. I love that. I have, I have a friend that's, uh, whose family is very, is, is very, uh, is very close. I've always her. liked her because she was always very kind to us. She was really cool. Yeah, yeah, she's, she's, a, she's a nice lady. Um, so, uh, just as we head down the home stretch here, um, any sponsors you want to shout out? Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, anybody, uh, anybody out there, uh, sponsor wise, equipment wise? Yeah, man. I always shout out to me and cause those are the people who take care of us. Thank you for saying that Drew. You know, yeah, yeah, um, sure. Harky amps, Harky, another New York company over here. Um, D'Addario strings, another New York company, right? They hook us up. Uh, EMG, my I have my signature EMP, EMG pickups. If you want to check those out, if you like uh, if you like some power, absolutely. Um, I'm moving. I'm currently moving to another bass company. I don't know. I didn't sign the contract yet, so I can't say it right now. But I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of I'm kind of psyched about. But uh, that's that. Within the next couple of months, I'll be announcing that. So I'm pretty psyched about it. With a new signature model. You know, I was gonna have. Um, one oh, of my one, more. one more. I'm sorry, Monster Energy. I have to say that. Thank you, Monster Energy. There you go. Yeah. So go ahead. I'm sorry, Drew. Yeah. Interesting that um, uh, someone that I grew up with uh, who played with me in Antidote went on to design the Sans Amp bass driver. And uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, stop right there. Who? Neil Osberg. We call him Zum. Zum. Because, I mean, we all do fucking Sans Amp. We all love the Sans Amp. He, he was going to come on. I was going to surprise you, but he's, ah. he's, he's driving. He's driving right now. He just said he can't make it, but I was going to bring him on. And, and he, um, I have so many questions. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was, he was super. He sent me some, some, he sent me a couple of things, including this. Um, he, he wanted, he, he, this, I had standing by because this is the base that he used with these, with these pickups to, and, and we still have the, the cat, the, the, the amp, we still have the stuff in storage, uh, and all this, but, this is the the guitar that he used, um, you know, when he created the bass driver. Wow! So he and, actually created it, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome, Jackson. Yeah. And, and 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 with these with these with these pickups in this Jackson, right? These are the boom. Those are the right. Yeah. With those, with those pickups, so amazing. You know, yeah. Yeah. He is he still with them now? What is he doing now? Oh no, he's not with them anymore. He's uh, he, actually he's uh, he's with this company Fryette, which is what Page plays. Of course. Yeah. So he's he's the connection with Page and and uh, with a lot of other people. He's uh, he's a big part of Fryette and Sound City. That's his thing now. That, you Dude, know, he, yeah, I'll connect you with him. Be a messenger for me. I'll connect you with him. Tell this dude I want to make a base a base pedal with him. Yeah. I, I would I'd be happy to do that. I would love to. He's got the ear, man. He's got the serious ear. Damn. Well, he's he's well loved on this show. He comes on, you know, every now and then. Um, you know, he's he's pretty wrapped up with with Fryette and Sound City, and I love you know, it. Yeah, that, that that that's what he does. So, uh, so that said, um, hold on. Let me see. I think we I think we pretty much covered it. Um, let me just see if I'm not. Any, we'll take one more. Anybody out there? Let me just see. I'm just scanning. Yeah, we did all that. We did Bruce Dickinson. We did the plane. We did. We did everything. Um, let's let's wrap it up with this right here, and let, let's bring it back. Um, yeah, make one for me. Mike Pooch says, make one for me. Yeah, we got you, Mike. Let me. I, we'll talk to Zum. I'll, I'll connect Zum with you guys. Awesome. Um, you know, we'll do it. Um, Yes, the book exactly. Larry says, "Bring it back to the book." And uh, <laughs> let, let's, uh, you know, and I think that this is an appropriate picture. That uh, well done, Drew. Well done. You hit my heart right now. Thank you for doing that. You, you, you are all heart, my friend. Wow. The book is uh, the book is Frank Fellow, fathers, brothers, and sons surviving anguish, abandonment, and anthrax. You can purchase it at www.rarebirdlit.com. It's also on uh, Amazon too, just so you guys know. It's on Amazon. It's on Amazon as well. Um, listen, 
Great show. Thanks for coming on. Um, I wish you all the best. Anybody you want to shout out on this shout out Sunday? Well, Mike Pooch for hooking this thing up. Thank you, of course, Drew. This is yeah. awesome. It was a more fun conversation than I even thought was going to. I knew we'd be, we'd be good, but this was <laughs> very fluid and just fun, man. So you brought back a lot of, and honestly, dude, in a real way, you brought back a lot of great memories. Those pictures before hit home. So thank, thank you, you for that, man. Yeah. My, my, my pleasure, it's, man. It's it uh, I'm fortunate. I'm doing something that I love doing and that people support me in doing these days. Um, like, like you and I were talking about before, you know, this really wasn't part of the plan. I'm a filmmaker first and foremost, but you know, I'm doing something now that my, my, woo, it's no, dude, you're, and, I, and this isn't a kiss ass thing. You know me, I, I'm not going to do that. This, you're good at this. So thank you for doing this sincerely. Thank you for going deep. You, you know, you, you ask the right questions and you, you give a great platform. So thanks for doing this, bro. In a real way. My, my pleasure, Frankie. And, uh, yo, let's talk soon. And, I, love uh, it. I, I, I wish you all the best out there. And you know what? You got to hook me up with your uncle because I want to do a show. I want to do a show with me and him. Yeah. Jaws, where we just talk about Dude. Jaws. He will, you know, I'll, I'll tell him. No doubt. I'll totally tell him. And you, you'll you be talking forever. He's got a lot of collection shit. Dude. I know. Nice. And like, I don't even want to talk about Anthrax. I want to talk. Hey, I want to shout out Vaughn Lewis. Uh, thank you, Vaughn. Uh, Vaughn, you Vaughn. Vaughn. Yeah. Vaughn. Vaughn. Good, good dude. And um, Harris says, thank you, Frank, for all the music you gave us for all these years. Huge fan since 88. Larry Kelly, uh, Boston, Massachusetts, represent. Thank you, Fred. Yes. Yes, I do my homework. <laughs> he does do his homework, man. It's awesome. It's great. It's, you know, uh, Ben Lejeu. Yeah, awesome. It was great. Great, it was great, a great show. time. Drew, Andrew, really good job. Andrea Katz, uh, you know, Long Island River. You know what? I got one more picture, Frankie. Uh -oh. well, uh, no, but this is like the last. I, I literally went through all the pictures. Oh, I good. guess you guys were just at Comic-Con, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I've, that's never, I've never been to Comic Con. I, I've always I always want to, but and then this year I'm like I don't know, man. You know, yeah, yeah, no, but you know what? They did it right. It was it was spacious. They, they did half audience, which was great. So people were very very smart about everything and uh, and very courteous. I did see with the masks. Everybody had their masks on. Sign, just saying hello to people, signing stuff. It was great. It was a great experience. So what what was the occasion that that got the band to Comic Con this year? Our graphic novel. Anthrax is a graphic novel. On Z2 Comics, just so you guys know, another thing out there. Uh, we did a, a bunch of us wrote some stories on it. You, if you look at it, look on it's on our website, Anthrax.com. You can look it up and get it if you like. Um, uh, you know, we're tr trying to stay busy in this wonderful time that we're having. You know, staying home, not touring. So you got to you got to be creative. You know. Nice, nice Thunderbird back there, bro. Yeah, I, I checked it out. They, you know what? I asked if I could have it. No, they said no. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, man. Uh, let's uh, let's go have let's go have dinner with our families, bro. I love you and thanks for everything. I, do. I love you too, Drew. You're in uh, my phone now, so don't be a stranger. I'm not kidding. I won't, man. I'll Thanks. talk to you soon, man. Take, Take care. care. Of yourself. Thank you for this, That's bro. My pleasure. My pleasure. Jeez. Bye, bye. Well, there you have it. Wow, great show, Frank Bello. Um, great guy. Uh, you know, great band. Uh, Hardworking guy. Um, thanks for sticking with us, everybody. Um, yeah, we even got some Sundance. We got some Sundance pictures in there, Andrea. How about that? Right? Thank you. It, it was it was a great one. Um, fantastic, man. Um, you know, who's up next? Oh, yeah, Richie Crutch is up next. I'm going to Florida tomorrow. Uh, please, I want to mention the book thing again. Please um, support and buy the book. Buy the book. There's the book. There's the link, www.stonefilmsnyc.com. Buy the book. You know, don't be scared. Buy the book. So that said, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was a great show. Good show. Ciao. Good night. All good. I want to end the show with, I'm going to end the show with the new Antidote NYHC video, Scarred, followed by the outro. Let me get everything let me get everything, everything out. Let me clear the deck. What was that? Nice to see Frank looking well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we talked a little bit about anthrax. Who, who wants to talk about that stuff anyway? <laughs> yeah, we did. Uh, here we go. Um, antidote. 
Let me find it. Give me a second. Del- delirium. Delirium is setting in. Thanks a lot, everybody. Antidote, Scott. electric thanks a lot everybody do good things and good things will come to you